Welcome, guys, to another episode of Cash the Curious, where we deep dive into those that are thriving in their field. On today's episode, we have Miss An- Angelia Bianca, um, anti-violence activist slash author of In Deep. And in the book, she actually deep dives into how she survived gang violence, how she survived drug addiction, and how she survived incarceration. Um, this was probably the most profound book of redemption. And while I was reading the book, I kept saying, no, Bianca, what are you doing? You keep going deeper and deeper and deeper until the the turning point of your father's death and you turned it around and you, you found out that I got to change something. Yeah, I knew I would die in the streets alone. Okay. So so the thing is, like, we'll just jump forward. Yeah. Um, after living that life, you know, and now, you know, it was at the end I was in the penitentiary. I knew my father. Keep in mind, I haven't hadn't seen my family for like 17, 18 years, but um, uh, he's still my father, right? Yeah. And so um, when the prison, my aunt called the prison and told them to tell me, you yeah. know, that he died. I knew he was sick because I my only aunt that stayed connected with me through when she'd find me in somebody's jail or prison. Uh, was my Aunt Louise, and she would write me. So I knew he was sick. And um, when the social worker came, the the officer came Mm -hmm. and said I had to go talk to the social worker. And I wish I could find that social worker because I would thank her because one single sentence changed my entire life. And so um, when she told me, I I hate to tell you, I regret to inform you, your father has passed away. I started crying obviously more out of guilt, you know, right. like, oh my God, how horrible daughter I am, right? And then I'm all choked up crying and she took my hand and very calmly said to me, Bianca, I want you to take comfort that your father died peacefully and with all his loved ones around him. Okay. So I choked it all in and I went to my cell and I kept replaying that in my head. And they were the best sentence word somebody could say to me because it made me realize I'll never have that privilege. I won't have that. I won't be able to die peacefully and with my loved ones around. I'm going to die of a bullet or a drug overdose and left in some alley or bleeding to death on a street and I'm going to be in a morgue. I started thinking about all this stuff and I thought I, I could picture myself in a morgue and um, and I thought, we all have to die, so what better way to die than peacefully with your loved ones? So I pictured myself in a morgue, and um, they'd have to fingerprint me to figure out who I was, which I, my record is like, um, it's thicker, like five of those books, my rap sheet. Anyway, um, but they would find my name out. But would they even know who I belonged to? Because mm. I'm so estranged from my family, right? And um and then worse, I thought, what if my family says, just do whatever you want with her because we've already grieved her, like my children, yeah. you know. So that made that is really what made me say, I was crying and I prayed to God. And I said, um, God, if you will take the taste of the streets and the heroin from my mouth until my last dying breath, I'll help people. And when I did get out of prison and I went to ACP even for help, and I, I'm not going to lie, it was, I was very, you know, re- reluctant. I, 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 was that the first time at Safe Haven? No, my so second, second time. time? Yeah. Okay. And so this is the last, and I never turned back. But, um, you know, I mean, I, I wanted to change. We always want to change. We just don't know the path. And there's a lot of obstacles for somebody like me and how deep of a hole I dug myself into. Um, anyway, and I remember the, them having like l- the little things like, you know, okay, your chore for today is to clean this window at eight o'clock. Mm. And then, you know, I'm like, ugh, you know, like I, I lived with no rules, did what I wanted. There was no cleaning involved. Right. right? So, um, I would kind of be resistant and they, I'd be like, look, it didn't rain. The window's clean. What is the big deal here? You know, and they'd go, okay, well, if you can't follow the rules, you have to participate. Otherwise you could leave, you know? Mm. And then I'd go, okay, no, all right, I'll, I'll, I'll wash the window. Right. So, and then as time went by, um, after two weeks then three weeks, then four weeks, and then people began to look at me with respect. And, and I, and I, I really liked that. And I thought, God, that was just so weird to me, right? That like they said, "Hey, hey, do you, uh, will you volunteer at five a.m. in the morning?" Because I lived there, you know. 
Will you volunteer at 5 a.m. in the morning to come at our front desk and answer the phones? You have a, you're very polite. You talk well. You like people. Right. And just say, you know, hello, this is a safe haven. And I was like, I was excited to do that. And I felt so important to be able to sit behind a desk and the phone to ring and you know, a safe haven. This is Bianca. How can I help you? Sure. Let me connect you. Like I felt like a really big deal, you know, like I felt like I was president of the United States or something. So, so people were started looking at me with respect and, and, uh, in an effort to keep my promise to God, because I was equally as addicted to the streets as I was to the heroin. I mean, I loved that lifestyle, right? That's all I knew. And, um, I started just randomly stopping and talking to young guys, kids, girls, boy, whatever, like, you know, teenagers, young adults, um, whether I knew them or I didn't know them, you know, and um, just randomly stopping and, um, you know, just to like say, hey, look, let me tell you the ugly side up front, right. you know, what what where this leads. And um, I'm grateful to a man named J.W. Hughes, who uh, was the program manager on the north side for Ceasefire, who happened to be driving by like like randomly over, over a period of a month and saw me three times. And he was like, God, that looks so odd. Yeah. I, this older white woman, and she's like in the hood and in a really high-risk block, you know? And so he finally pulled over and he, and every, all the guys knew him and they were like, hey, J-Dub, what's up, you know? And then he looked at me and he said, um, hey, uh, sister, can I talk to you? And I was like, sure. And he was like, will you walk with me? And I go, sure. And we walked a little ways away. And he goes, I, I don't mean any harm. I swear I don't. Because he's an African-American man. <laughs> and he said, I don't mean any harm at all. He said, but I have never in my life seen an older white woman in interacting so smoothly and genuinely with um, teenage African-American boys, right? right? And he goes, do you know that they're in a gang? And I go, yeah, I know. And he goes, do you know that? They probably may have a gun on them. And I'm like, yeah, you know, whatever, you know. And then he was like, what are you saying to them? And I go, oh, I'm just trying to, in a joking, loving way, let them know the ugly side up front so they're not as shocked to be have a cell door slammed on their face and you're not Ooh. going nowhere for a long time. And then he said, you, you know, you're kind of doing the work we do. And I go, oh. And he was like, do you, I need a violence interrupter. Do you want to? apply for the job and it pays $15 an hour, which to me, I was like, Oh my God, you know, I, I'm like, I don't even know what a violence interrupter is, but I know you're, this is what I thought. Cause he was like, have you ever heard of ceasefire? Right. And I said, Oh yeah, you're the people that pass out the, um, flyers that say, don't shoot. I want to grow up with the kid on it. Mm -hmm. And he was, he laughed and he goes, and now I know it's way more than that, you know? (laughs) But anyway, at that time I go, yeah, I'm from the West side. And then he said, um, well, you're basically interrupting violence right now right. by talking to them, you right. know, and they, and they see, he goes, do you know them? How long have you known them? And I'm like, well, I, I've known them for an hour, but I feel like we're family now. And he was like, oh God, you have to apply. So he gave me the job against everyone else. Yeah, the panel didn't see, see what no, he was seeing. No, because you have to go through a panel interview right. and the panel consists of like a community person, maybe a pastor. Sometimes they put a police officer on the panel. Um... Or like other people within the organization, higher ups, uh, to you know, just a community. Like you could be on a panel if you live in that community. If you, if you have, if you're invested in, in the community, sure, right? Yeah. And so um, everyone voted no. There was a man from another organization, and and I was so excited to have like an actual real job interview, right? And then and then also like coming the life I came from, I should have been dead a thousand times. So. I remember um, printing off this resume that Mm -hmm. often people who have a life like mine and come out of prison, we don't have any experience. We've never worked, right? So it has to be like, you know, work experience. Um, And like, okay, if I clean floors or buff floors in the prison, then then we have to make that into like some volunteer experience or something. So um, anyway, and um, so I was, I borrowed somebody's little, leather folder thing you know zipped and put my resumes okay. and i got a new suit from well secondhand store but anyway safe haven helped me get a suit and um, i had my hair done and sure. i was i mean i was just like on top of the world so when i walked in there the, the whole panel aside of jw hughes was looking at me like you know and the this one man from another organization said 
um, Bianca, maybe you'd be better fit for like an executive assistant in a building downtown. You know, like I just look to, you know, I, they just didn't see they the, wanted you to dress in like street attire or I don't know you know I don't know you know maybe I don't know like I like it was like oh she's too white she's too oh, old she's right. on parole she lives in a homeless shelter um that they once somebody asked me the question um so what does Bianca do in the dark when no one's watching mm. and I go well I could tell you exactly what I do in the dark when no one's watching and he's like okay and I go well, um, I watch um, Star Trek. I'm a Trekkie, and um, and I watch Andy Griffith, and then I go to sleep, you know. Right, right, and then right, he's right, like, right. "Well, so you get this job that pays fifteen dollars an hour. You get your first paycheck. Are you going to go cop heroin? You know?" And I said, and he goes, "How do we know you're not going to go cop heroin, right? And, and relapse?" And I go. Well, I can tell you exactly what I'll do. I, I exactly, and he's like, okay. And I said, so I actually have a little part-time job at a salad place, and um, and I only make about eighty dollars a week. But every single check that I make, I the for my first check there, I went and opened a bank account, a savings account at Bank of America, and I put every check in there, and I have every dime, and I'm saving for an apartment. So that's what I'm going to do. And so he was getting like almost frustrated because. You know, like You're he was coming back at him, yeah. Well, it was the truth, though. Right. You know, I mean, that's what I was doing. And so then, um, anyway, so I left, and then I was told after the fact that everyone said no. They all voted no. Still, no, still, no. huh? Yeah, they all voted no. Like I was too old, too white, I'm parole, blah blah blah. So anyway, so J. W. Hughes said, you know, I um, see something in this girl, and. I think she has potential and there's something about her that I'm going to hire her. If this ends badly, it's on me. It's on me. Right. And he had the right. final say. Yeah. So he hired me. So they put me in the area in Rogers Park that they call the jungle. And um, it's like Plaina and all the way to Juneway in that little area okay. by Triangle Park. And um, mm -hmm. prior to me, and they put me on the team and with the, the guys, I was the only girl. And I learned this about three weeks after working there that um, my my team members, my coworkers, right, were all taking bets because they were like all hardcore, you know, guys, right. Uh, so I guess people weren't really seeing, literally how looking long at me. Last? No, just looking at me to see like this girl is hood as hell. You know what I mean? Like, but I, you, you know, I can be like normal, and you know, what I mean, I know a whole lot of stuff that some others don't right, right? right. so um they were even like on the side joking going oh she won't last a week she won't last two weeks they're putting money on it right and so then um they put me in the jungle that was my assigned area because it was very hard to get to that group of young men like they really weren't open to you know they'd say hi to you and that's about it mm -hmm. you know like hey what's up and move on but to actually get to be able to mediate a conflict or build a tight relationship where, mm -hmm. where they would talk to you before maybe doing something stupid, right. like pulling a trigger, right? And um, so they thought, oh, definitely she'll fail there. There's no right. way those guys are letting her in. And after two weeks, um, the, the supervisors and managers usually do walkthroughs in the community. And I got a call, I was on my way to work, and the supervisor said, Bianca, we're doing a walkthrough on Howard. And I go, oh, I'm on my way right now. And he goes, no, 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 that's not why I'm calling. He's like, man, you like own Howard Street. And I go, what do you mean? And he goes, you've only been here two weeks. We're walking through. The only thing people are saying is, hey, where's that white girl? Or where's Bianca? Or where's the girl in the orange jacket? You know? And so I go, oh, he's like, man, I can't even believe it. I got to apologize to him in person. And then the whole team then, and when we were in a, a team meeting, they were like, man, we had you wrong. We had no, they probably thought I was going to like get scary or punk out. I, right. I'm like fearless, right? right. So, um, and uh, they are lifetime bonds in my family, oh. the coworkers, and even though some of them have moved on, but I respect them highly. And J.W. Hughes says that I remain, he's been a boss for a million years, and he yeah. said that I remain his best hire in his whole life. No way. So crazy, right? I'm that, so honored that he took amazing. a chance on me. Yeah. Can you can you take us back all all the way back yeah. to to the childhood and like how how you ended up in a gang or like how you first got into into drugs and all that? 
Yeah, so I, I, I was raised by my, by my uh, father's mother, my grandma, me and my sister, and um, our mother left. Um, uh, there, there was marital problems, whatever, um, but as a little girl, you don't know. You just know you don't have a mother, right? And then I end up doing the same thing to my children, right? Mm. But anyway, so but as a child, um, coming from uh, a Sicilian family who were immigrants from Sicily, mm -hmm. right? Very old fashioned, not educated, hard workers though, right? Mm -hmm. And, um, but um, I was a hard, I, I mean, my sister, they always joke even now, she always paid attention to the program, followed the rules, mm -hmm. you know? If you told her to sit here with the Barbie doll and she'd play, I was never like that. I was always really hyper and there was never enough and I was always getting into trouble. And I was never scared of anything. And so when I, I'm sure that um, at the age of four, I was left with a babysitter and um, and he uh, sexually assaulted me as yeah. a child and as a four year old and, um, or sexually abused me actually not, mm -hmm. you know, I mean, it was l literal stuff. So anyway, and I did tell, I wasn't the kind of kid that was gonna be scared, like, oh, don't tell your mommy. You yeah. know, as soon as she came, I busted the man out right away, right. my little four-year-old, you know, <laughs> badass, right? But anyway, so, but but coming from a Sicilian family, it's like, and especially that it was a whole nother world in another time zone right. of 1963, right? That like, you don't want the neighbors, and oh my God, you don't call a psychiatrist. Right, right. Like, no, she'll be fine. We just don't talk about it anymore. So I just dealt with it. I mean, I don't know, whatever, it just went away, right? And then my mother leaving when I was five, I believe that, um, I, and I was very traumatized. I was very close with my mother. And I didn't understand because I was five. So I didn't, you know, I mean, how would I understand right. that there were marital problems, right? And, um, and then moving with, going with into Little Italy with my grandma and my grandpa and my sister. And my grandfather was dying of cancer. And, you know, in those days, like me and my sister were really the first generation where um, they were, our family was able to like do good and buy us clothes and things like that. Mm. You know, like my father was raised very poor mm. in Little Italy on Jacobin Street, like had to go to, to, to the Hull House, Jane Addams mm -hmm. after school. I mean, like they were extremely poor. You know, my grandmother used to iron um, when we first came to this country. She used to iron um, clothes for like a penny a shirt. I mean, like they were very poor, you know. Wow. So, but anyway, so I was overly spoiled. And I think because, well, probably my sister could have been, but she always was a good kid and just would like, okay, you know. And I was like a maniac, right? So I think they overcompensated me of the loss of my mother and felt guilty or something. Okay. So. I was so wild. I didn't have the parental supervision that I should have had. Okay. And my gra I was the favorite of my grandmother and um she uh, her, her own daughter would say, "Ma, you know you have you have your own you have children of your own. That's your granddaughter. And you have other grandchildren." And she'd go, "I know. I know, but I just love her, you know." So it, it she was like my she could have been a co-defendant let me put yeah, it that way yeah, yeah, i mean yeah. without the crime you know right, right. she would stick up for me for anything right. if i came home in eighth grade and and came home at three in the morning she would lie for me and say no she's been home since nine you know i mean so i um just was out of control and then i started um smoking weed and my friend's father was dying of cancer we were nine years old and we were stealing his father's medicine. Yeah. It was pain medicine. Right, we didn't know right. that. We just knew we took it and we liked the way it felt, right? Mm. So um, I was taking morphine. And then from there it went to, um, I grew up, uh, well, Little Italy and then Oak Park. Mm. And then at a very young age, pretty young age, late in my teens, ended up in Arizona. And then when I came back, it was very brief, Oak Park and then West Side from there. Then I, okay. there, for the rest of the, duration yeah. Pilsen Little Village um, the projects but anyway and Pulaski but anyway um, but I just um, I started hitchhiking across that's why I love your pictures <laughs> I started hitchhiking across the country like randomly like I don't even know like 
I don't know if this is a thing, but I should do some research. But I don't think I was born with a, the fear factor somewhere oh. in my head. Um, although I'm scared to death of a rat or like an animal, <laughs> like if like if you know like if I it's real I'm real weird. But anyway, but um, I would leave. I went to Oak Park River Forest High School okay. briefly and then dropped out. But while I was there, I remember one day getting out of school. Had, had my little school bag and I remember I had a jean skirt on and this was back in the hippie days and um, my jean skirt and a little jean jacket and um, my um, leather I can, and I have like a photographic memory so my um, lace up soft brown leather moccasin boots that came to my knee you know I thought I was really cool I was cool <laughs> and so um, <laughs> anyway and um, I'm walking home from school and I go you know I want to go to California. I'm going to go right now. And I just wandered my way to the Eisenhower, walked, started hitchhiking, told someone, can you get me to 80? I'm going to 80 West. The next thing you know, I'm, I'm hitchhiking down 80, you know, like, and I'm stopping in Colorado. I'm stopping. Right. I'm, like I, by myself, you yeah, know, yeah. alone by myself. With just that bag. Just my school bag. Yeah. I remember one time um, when I was young, I was a teenager, and um, another time I thought, oh, I'm going to, this is after I had already been to Arizona, mm. so I probably was like maybe 19 mm. at the time. I had came back, um, and then I wanted to go back, to, came back to Chicago, I wanted to go back to Arizona. So I thought, oh, just hitchhike, right? So again, with my little boots, those same boots, and because I wore them all the time, and um, and I, I wore a lot of jean everything. I still actually do. But anyway, so I met the little rip, my little rip jean hippie sign stuff on my jean skirt, little jean jacket, and a little bag, backpack. And I started hitchhiking. So I make it all the way to New Mexico, right? Mm. And um, I get in a car with some man who says, where are you going? And I'm like, well, you know, I'm going all the way to Tucson. And he's like, well, I'm going to Albuquerque. And I'm like, okay, well, that's cool. That will get me closer. So we're on the way to Albuquerque. He's drinking, he's drunk, and now he's mm. trying to make advances at, at mm. me, the little girl, right? So I start you know, yelling at him. So he's like, oh, you're just a big baby. Get out of my car. He pulled over in the desert and um, and made me get out of his car. So now I'm in the middle of the desert. Like We're, we're literally on a road where a car comes by maybe once every 10 hours right oh so i'm like walking and walking and i'm like you know i had no water or nothing so i'm trying to pretend in my i'm very visual in my head and yeah. i think i think that's what um helped me survive because i visualize scenarios yeah like so in like i remember that i was visualizing people the pil pilgrims that tra during the gold rush not pilgrims but people that were like the wagon trains that were trying to make it to california mm -hmm. for the gold rush how hard it was for them yeah i'm like thinking that. like right, i could right. do you, this yeah, i could yeah, do yeah. this people did this before or i'm thinking i'm i'm, I'm pocahontas you know so uh, so i'm just walking and walking and it's like all day and i and and, and, and the road was like kind of going it's at some points a little because it's getting kind of mountainy now right, you know right. and like like we like a little winding where I'm walking this road, not one car, and now it's starting to get dark. And I thought, oh God, what am I gonna do, right? So I found um, kind of like your painting, your not painting, but your picture here, but not that high up. But I found like a little a road where it's like a little mountain area. Mm. Well, I saw a little ledge, you know, and I just sat on the ledge and backed my back up onto the mountain and crossed, you know, Indian style on my knees with my little backpack. And thought, okay, I, I was scared to die. That I really was scared that night because I was afraid of rattlesnakes. And I thought mm. I could hear the coyotes. And I thought, you know, I mean, I was kind of a little bit freaked out. You know, it didn't never stop me from doing it again, but I was freaked out. Anyway, morning came. I think I might have dozed off a little bit, but morning came. Sort of walking again. A car came by. Felt sorry. I probably literally looked like I was twelve, you know. Right, right. And a car stopped by and drove me all the way to Albuquerque, where uh, then I continued on my journey. But yeah. I, I must have did that probably I don't even know how many times, 30, 40, 50 times. Oh yeah. I was always doing that. Yeah. yeah. So you were you were you were motivated by by a sense of adventure, by yeah, a I've, sense I've, of thrill I've and and you essentially had, you know, Maybe not the support, but like you always got away with everything. Yeah, I was always really, yeah. Like I could always justify things somehow, even right. though I would know they were wrong. But I almost 
would justify my, to myself to ma- kind of visualize that this is why I'm doing this. Right, right. And this is a legitimate reason. Yeah. You know? That that initial, um, correct me if I'm wrong, the, the initial, when you were like trying to get money to, to go out west. Oh, and I hustled my father. And you hustled your, yeah. well, he, he said he would match you halfway yeah. or something like that. Yeah, and then, yeah. And then you went down to like, was it Michigan Avenue? And, yeah, panhandled. And you were panhandled. <laughs> panhandled. No, yeah. I went to State and Lake and um, like, I, I can't, I don't even know. Like the, I, I think now as an adult, and I'm going to be 61 in August, okay. and um, and then after going through all that life and then being clean now over nine years, right, and a productive law-abiding citizen, I look back and I think, if I see a kid like that, you got to really watch kids like that, right? So, like, I concocted this whole thing in my head, right? And I thought, I know what I'll do. So I at back in those days, the, um, sw- the swim caps the, were a big deal, you know? Nobody liked to wear them, but, you know, that gave the good effect, I mm-hmm. thought, right? Even though if I went in water, I didn't wear a cap, mm-hmm. you know? But I thought, okay, I'll bring a swim cap. And I'm gonna, I am put my little one-piece bathing suit on. And um, I had a towel around my waist and my flip-flops. I really didn't even go to the beach. And um, I took the um, – back then it was just the Lake Street Doll, yeah. which now would be the Green Line. Okay. And, um, and I got off at State and Lake. And I stood on that corner all day long, you know, excuse me, sir, I lost my money at the beach and I have to get home, you know. Uh. And so back then they had tokens. Um, like not To use the train, yeah, instead yeah. of the venture card, yeah. Like it, like it looked like a, you know, a lot of millenniums wouldn't even know what that is. But um, they looked like a coin, right? And so I so I ended up collecting a lot of those. But I, I ended up making like, I don't know, $150 or something wow. like that. And, and and I stayed there all day long during all the rush hours, all day with my little bathing suit and the towel around, you know, and holding my, my, my swim cap, you know, in my hand. And, oh, my God, hysterical. But, I mean, I'm not proud of the things I did, but yeah. it is what it is. But anyway, and then, um, you know, I stole the um, emerald ring yeah. from, uh, like, a little secondhand store in Oak Park, pawned it. And I actually only really needed 400 to go on the trip um, to um, Spokane to the World's Fair when I was like, I think I probably was 15 years old. And um, I ended up making 400 on my own, or a little more than 400. Wow. But I didn't show my dad the whole thing. I only said I had two. He gave me two, you know? So there there I had it. I was good, you know? So, Amazing. yeah. Um, and I don't know, like, you just survived you hustled and and you survived and yeah I um was never one of those people to just say like I don't know like you know there's a lot of people that um you carved out your own fate kind of thing yeah kind of yeah because some people just kind of like you know I mean they're I mean I'm not I'm not downing any anyone at all like but like some people are just like okay I have a dope habit or I need money or I'm hungry or whatever let me just try to get 20 30 bucks and I'm I'm done I I never I my drive was way past that you know mm. so it wasn't just like okay you know I need two bags I need food I need cigarettes or whatever I would hustle until I get four like I, I couldn't even I thought I I would never even stop hustling if so I you only did had a hundred dollars I'd be like for the hustle it was for the the hustle. You loved the hustle I loved the hustle yeah I loved the hustle and in my mind I wasn't hurting anybody but now looking back probably somebody may have needed that money sure. for food for their family you sure. know so um you know and I, and I don't like that but you know but yeah that's who I used to be that's not who I am anymore sure. you know but but uh I remember when I after I changed my life around and uh I thought, let me work. I, I didn't have a car or anything. And I thought, let me work on getting my, my license had been suspended for mm. 29 years. And so um, unpaid um, speeding tickets, right, <laughs> for 29 years. And nine, who needed ID? I was a criminal, right? right? right. So anyway, so <laughs> this is hysterical. But I so I, I thought, let me start this process and take care of this now. So I go to, uh, it, they were from Cicero. So I had to go to Maywood Courthouse. And I started, you know, getting a court date, motion for a court date so mm. I can pay the fine or whatever, right? Mm-hmm. 
but I had four speeding tickets. So the law in Illinois, if you if you're convicted for three moving violations in one year, you, they suspend your license for okay. a year, right? So even though it was 29 years ago, I had not been convicted. So if I would have been convicted for all four, I would have still been suspended for yet another year. So I thought, oh, hold on here, right? So I. Um, went into court, and I feel like the judge almost found me entertaining to a point, you know? So I thought, um, okay, I'm gonna pay, I'm gonna, because you, you can't have three, right? right? So I paid two of them, okay? And I had two left. And so, because if I would have paid the third one, that's the, con- the same as the conviction. So I got a court date, I went into the court, and I told the judge, you know, I, he said, I, you know, I told him, uh, you know, I want to pay them, but the, I don't want my license to be then suspended, blah, blah, blah. So he said, wait, hold on. These are 29 years old. And then um, I said, yeah. And he goes, wait, all from Cicero? And I go, yeah. He goes, wait, I'm so confused, you know. So I told the judge, I go, okay, Your Honor, so I used to be a criminal. I'm not a criminal anymore. And he was just like, oh, my God. And I go, now, today, I'm a law-abiding, tax-paying, sober citizen who gives back. And I work for Ceasefire. And I you know, help stop shootings and killings. And, and then he was just like, OK, tell me more. He's like, so and I go, well, Your Honor, he goes, were you guilty for these tickets? And I go, you know, Your Honor, I don't lie anymore. And um, yeah. I actually was guilty. I was speeding. I more than likely was going to buy drugs and in a hurry to buy drugs. And then he said, well, he goes, wow, you, you just said that. And I go, yeah. And then he go, he looked at the uh, the police in the jury box. And he said, are there any old timers here? Does anybody remember her? And one guy was like, oh, I, I, I know who she is. Oh. And then I was like, oh, I, I apologize, you guys. I, I know I gave you a run for your money, right? So anyway, it, it I could hear her. And the, the other people waiting in court to he- get their tickets heard, I took up so much time that I could hear them. I could hear people like, <sighs> like right, right, oh, right. God, could she hurry up? You know, and but the judge kept asking me questions. And then the state's attorney was like not wanting to let it go. Mm. You know, like, no, 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 we're going to she just said she's guilty. And the judge goes, OK, so I'll tell you what to the state. Um, find the officer that wrote these tickets 29 years ago and let's have a jury trial. Yeah, okay. At, right, you know, he's probably <laughs> retired, right? And so let's find him and bring him in. Let's have a jury trial. Do you want a jury trial, Miss Bianca? And I said, absolutely, I, I, I would like a jury trial. And then, um, then the state was like, okay, we have nothing further then. And then the judge said, you know, I'm going to throw these out so that way you can just go pay your reinstatement fee and you get your license. And I, the whole all the police stood up and gave me a standing ovation clapping. I was like, oh, my God, that's, like, so odd. You know, they usually hate me, right? So, but it, but it turned out good. And then I went and paid my, um, whatever it was, the, the fee to reinstate. Right. And on um, State Street, I got my license. And I can't tell you how excited that I was to have that. Random people on the bus all he had to hear about what I just told you, you know? <laughs> like, Look, guys, I got it. <laughs> yeah, I was showing people, you know, they were like, oh, okay, you know? I, like, So it, it was like I, my, um, my sister who lives in Florida, who's actually here right now, but I'm visiting, but she always jokes wherever we're in public or not. She was like, I, don't pay attention, my sister. She was raised in the penitentiary, you know? So we laugh. But it's almost like I feel like um, because I basically, if you think about it, was in a self-induced drug coma since I was nine years old yeah. until I was 50 or 51, right? And um, so everything, I, I don't take anything for granted. And I'm grateful to watch in the fall a leaf fall off the tree. Mm-hmm. I notice everything. I have a clear head. I, I, can, I have compassion and empathy for people, and I can relate, not only relate to people's situations because I've been there, but also even just, I mean, it doesn't, like I, I could be sitting on that, I could be sit right here, and I would sit there, I could sit there all day by myself, just staring at the, and I would be analyzing the trees, you know, and, and the rock formation, and the colors, like I notice everything now, right? Mm. And, and um, you know, it's a, it's a really good feeling, and I don't, 
have to ever be rich. I don't care about that as long as I can pay my bills and be alive. Like people pray to God for um, all type of things, right? Yeah. My only prayer, I, I pray for people's lives, right? Mm. For violence to stop. But I don't ever ask God for anything for me except for I ask him for one thing. I do pray to God to please let me live for 20 more years so I can help as many people more people in 20 years you know so thank god i'm healthy so i don't know but anyway but yeah i um like i said i'm really grateful for my life today i'm grateful to be able to touch people's lives um through my book i was so brutally honest that i've had women of all you know different types of women Mm -hmm. whether they're doctors or on the street or a teacher say to me like wow I have to take my hat off to you because the things that you admitted in that book, I would never have admitted. You Mm -hmm. know what I mean? And I'm like, well, you know what? If you want to help somebody, you can't tell half a story. You have to tell the whole story, right? So that way someone could really relate. And I know that my story has helped so many people already because I get random moms or teenagers or young adults inboxing me whether it's on instagram twitter or facebook from literally around the world saying that this inspired them or Mm -hmm. inspired them to go to treatment or to get out of the gang or like to you know fall back a little and not be so hot-headed to want to kill somebody right so right can you talk about what gang life was like and like what like what lured you into it and what was appealing at the time of it so with me, I think it was a sense of belonging, and I believe okay. it's a lot for for most people. Okay. And 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 it, like the general person would be like, well, you come from a really loving family, and you know they did love me, but I don't know somehow. Maybe you felt ne- neglected or just. No, I never felt neglected. I was always spoiled and loved. Yeah. I knew they loved me. Okay. Yeah, they did everything they could to try to help me. They were always bonding. My father always bonding me out of jail because I but was. I've been getting arrested since thirteen years old. Is it being there in person, like spending time? Did they do a lot of that? No, um, not really. So is that? Do you well, think that's what you were? Missing? Maybe. Okay. Maybe a, a a belonging, a feeling like that of with the actual family or something. My grandmother, you know, we spent time, but you know, um, she was always at home. You know, so yeah. if I wanted to hang with my grandma, which I same. loved yeah. my grandma. She was. I loved her more than anything or anyone in the world. And I have to live with the guilt now that she died with a broken heart because of me. You know, mm. be- she didn't die because of me, but she died with a broken heart. Right. The, the last words that she spoke before she died is um, she t- my Uncle Joey. She um, said to him, uh, she looked at him and she said, Joey, take care of my Angela. She called me Angela. Take care of my Angela. And he had to say to his mother, Ma, I can't promise you that. I don't even know where she's at. Mm-hmm. And then my grandmother died. Those literally the last word she said was Angela. Mm-hmm. And so, I mean, but, you know, I, I, I have to hope and pray that somehow she knows I'm okay now and she could finally rest in peace, right? Yeah. But anyway, I was her whole life. But, um, but I, mean, I don't you know. a sense of belonging. Yeah, I don't, yeah. So I feel like when I started hanging in Humble Park mm-hmm. and, you know, um, I don't know. I just felt like I belonged with them. I was in the mix. I was selling drugs with them, you know. Um, you also probably, did you see that people were respected? Yeah, yeah, you know, you oh, absolutely. You kind of mentioned earlier now that yeah. now that you had a job and you felt, it was felt respected. Like real, that's but... real respect, though. That's not respect because <laughs> the they were kind of respect that I had years ago it was a fear of respect because right. if you would have messed with me, somebody oh. else would have. So it was more of a, it's not real respect. Okay. That's why I tell young guys. Now, it's not real respect. Right. It's just respect because... They know who you are or who you know, and that person then, you know, could, I mean, there could be violence behind that or something, right? right. But um, I just went all all in. I went in deep. I went all in. And that's like what the book is called in deep, because as Linda and I were writing it, um, you know, Linda would record me and, you know, like during me talking, and I, I would say to her, Oh God, I went in deep. I went, and I used to say that even in my dysfunctional life, you know, like if I was going to go do bad checks at a bank, I'm like, I'm going in, I'm going in deep, you know. I mean, so I, oh, that was something I did, I did all the yeah, time, yeah, you know. Yeah, yeah. But with the gang, I started hanging around them, and they accepted me, and you know, I kind of proved, you know, that I had a lot of heart. You know, I often heard, gosh, you know, she's got more heart than a lot of these guys, and you know, I, I, um. 
you know, I, I myself have never killed or shot anybody, right. but I've been around a lot of violence. I, I have been shot myself. A, a bullet went through and through my leg. Um, that ricocheted off of a stair, uh, the project um, cement stairs. Um, anyway, but with the gang, I was totally willing to take a three minute violation on the wall to be, um, you know, blessed into the gang. Like an initiation. Yeah, it's initiation, yeah. right? Yeah. So, um, and I was totally willing to take that. I felt like, you know, like, yeah, I'm a badass and, mm. you know, I'm with these people and I belonged and they trusted me and they respected me and I respected them. And, it was just like so crazy, but I went all in, and uh, you know, slow. Um, after some years, I, you know, slowly kind of drifted away mm -hmm. from them because then I started hanging in other areas of Chicago, and ended up in the projects, and then I was with uh, my last few kids, baby daddy Blue, um, and he uh, at. Um, now everyone gets old and it's not the same. But when you, when we're young and high on the hog, you know, like he was a um, leader of the, of the Four Corner Hustlers mm. and uh, on the uh, Pulaski area, and um, you know, I thought he I thought he was the shit. I yeah, mean, like yeah. he like the respect that he got because he was like a five star Universal Elite, and I used to love to say that my man is a five star Universal mm. Elite. Anyway, so I kind of drifted away from the from the, the um, Latin Kings and um, and then but I was still in the life right, right and so right. then I was with him all the time and uh, and then I remember going back to the penitentiary and I actually had to take a violation from the Queen sisters right. because it was like where'd you go you just faded off and like and they were like you know but I'm like okay give me the violation you know because I would never have just said I want to be dead to you you know like right. I always want to be in good graces so yeah. I took the violation for falling off the wagon you and know just briefly explain what a violation entails so a violation entails um a certain amount of minutes of uh beat, being beat up yeah. so in the penitentiary it's a rule if you're in the penitentiary and you get a violation because they have actual rules right yeah. and so um and if you get a violation every gang is different but you this is pretty general in in a penitentiary um a violation would have to be from the neck down that way you can cover Hi, okay. can bruises that. or okay. something. Gotcha. You know what I mean? Yeah. So because if they if it was a full body violation, then your face might be all messed up, and then IA is going to do an investigation, and then they're going to lock the the place down. Right. And, you know. So in prison, it's usually from the neck down. So I um, at the time the girl, the lady, or well, she was a girl anyway. We're all young. Um, who was calling it for the Latin Queens and Logan? Um, deemed that I needed a three minute violation. So I stood um, with, there were three people in the cell, two were beating me up and um, and then one timing, you know, the three minutes. That's insane. Yeah, it was like the longest three minutes That's of my life, I'm telling you. insane. But I was like, then, you know, even in my first initiation, I was like, you know, because I was really cool with the queen sister that had to violate, or not violate, initiate me into the gang. And she kept, she felt bad, you know, but they like, and especially like uh, for a violation, they have to see that you bruised the person or then you'll get a violation. Oh my God. Yeah, it's like crazy, <laughs> right? Because otherwise you'd like let them off easy, you know? Okay. And then they have like, so, it, you know, different violations could be SOS, shoot on site, you know? So, that, but those are like a leg shot, oh. you know, for like, you have to do something really bad for that, right, you know? Right. I mean, I never had a violation. I just had a little, like, little minor violation for dropping out of sight, you know, but, um, but anyway, but I was very loyal to them and, um, you know, there was a time in my life where I couldn't go in certain areas of Chicago. Obviously I have a teardrop on the left side of my eye. Um, mine is hollow. So hollow within the Latin Kings means that you're mourning a death. Mm. Solid would mean that I avenged a death, mm. right? So mine's hollow and, um, for, um, at the time, years ago, you read in the book, um, uh, our chief our, um, was killed in front of me. And then also my first baby daddy um, was killed. So um, anyway, so um, I got it tattooed on. But proudly, because the left side, kings, right, the mm. people side. And um, so there, I couldn't go in, you know, certain areas or, wow. you know, because of rival gangs, right? And... Um, 
today I could go anywhere I want, and even and people often ask, like if I have a crown, a Latin King crown, mm-hmm. on my hand, and um, people will say to me like, and it doesn't matter. I'm like universal. I'm always like, hey, I'm not an op. Opposition, the gangs use that term t- to talk about a rival gang member. Sure. They're ops. You yeah. know, I don't know if your viewers know know that. So, nope. okay, so an op is a rival gang member. Okay. So, um, anyway. So now I joke with people if I'm in an area that would not have been uh, my affiliation, uh, you know, and, and I joke with them, you know, I don't have any ops. I have no ops, you know, <laughs> I have no enemies, right? So, um, but, um, and it's a good feeling to be able to go wherever. And I, and I often joke about it with guys who would have been a rival gang to mm. in my heyday, right? And I'm always like, oh, so this is how this chicken place tastes, you know? Because I, you know, I could never have gone there before, right? <laughs> right, right, yeah. right, right. So, but being in the gang, I felt powerful and I, um, you know, I kind of felt like I was really running something, you know? Yeah. And uh, I, I felt that, I often think to myself, if I never went down that road, right, I could have probably gone really far because I've done a whole lot in a short period of time, right? Yeah. And um, but on the other hand, I don't regret going through that life. I don't blame anyone for my choices, right? I take full accountability. But if I didn't go through that life, I couldn't do the work I do today, right? Mm-hmm. And be so successful at it. Mm-hmm. The only regret I have is that I hurt the people I love my family and my children that's mm-hmm. if I could eliminate that there's For sure. I have no other regrets of course. even h- how horrible it ended we all start in this life like a lot of the young guys and young girls which I tell them and I mean there were times I was walking around like going to, at the dub spot that my man ran mm. I'd stop by pick up 30 40 thousand cash put it in my purse you know drop the, drop the drugs off um you know, like you're riding high off the hog, right? Yeah. That's the life. Well, in the end, you're broke. You have nobody. I was homeless, living in abandoned buildings, putting tissue in my ear. Yeah, for so, the roaches. So yeah. roaches wouldn't right. crawl in, right? Right, right? And then as it gets darker, the light's going away. It's getting, becoming night. You could literally feel them crawling on you. So, like, I was willing to put up with all that because I didn't think – that there was a way out. I just didn't. I didn't know what to do, right? Yeah. And I, so I figured, well, I got. I'm a survivor, so I still somehow. I, and I was, and I love pills. This was with a baby too, right? Yeah, it was several. I had five kids, you know. <laughs> yeah, so thankfully my family took them all. You know, like well, different people. Yeah. And the last two were adopted out, and mm. but still um, connected with my family, yeah. so they still saw their um, siblings, but. Um, but it, yeah, it's really crazy. Um, my last child, Aliyah, um, I thought I, you know, I, I don't want another baby taken away from me. I want to keep my baby. Like how delusional! I didn't even have a home, you know. Yeah. And um, but I did go into treatment and I cleaned up. And so she was born at West Suburban Hospital in 1997, mm. and she was drug free. But um. I that was only because I did that, you know, because of the baby, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. But then I get out, and now I got to hustle to have money to buy stuff, and I had really, literally nowhere to go. So you always saw me. I only had her for about three months till I the brutal awakening that I had to have that like you can't take care of this baby. This is wrong, you know. And she was born in September, and um, was starting to get cold out, and. you know the the little baby packs that you could put on your back or the front so she was always on the front and she was a really good baby and i loved her and wherever she was always with me you know and um but it got to a point you know where i knew there's no way i can keep this baby um but like i was going to say about like with pilsen and little village like like there's so many communities in chicago that were there for me back in the day throughout Chicago, everywhere. I could tell you a story about every corner in Chicago, right? And But specifically Pilsen, like, you know, like all the ladies are, like who own the secondhand stores mm-hmm. um, down 18th Street would always let me come in and I they, they'd just give me an outfit and they'd right, let me go in right. their bathroom in the back and change and wash up. And then I had Liz Salon who'd always do my hair for free, you know? And so even though I probably looked horrible, my hair always looked nice, you know? And so, and I, she, I actually still go there because I thought to myself, 
this woman and her salon were there for me when I had nothing and no one, right? She used to let me um, leave things in her back um, in the back office of her salon, like a change of clothing yeah, or yeah, whatever, right? right? And and so like now, then I, I get my life together and have a job where I can afford to pay a stylist why would I go to someone else, right? Yeah. I still go to I still go to Liz Salon and Liz, and and I would never. I always told her, please never retire, you know, because I won't have anywhere to go. But anyway, um, all the taco places would all, because you know you get up and you you got first you got to think about yeah. dope, you got to get your dope, then you're hungry. And so I, there were all the little corner stores in Pilsen. They'd always front me a pack of cigarettes, wow. tacos, or you know whatever. You know my coffee in the morning. The dope dealers would always, um, I had a, I mean, there's, um, you know, like, uh, 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 um, you know, I, I, I was real honorable among, among the, the crime world, you know, I had that kind of reputation. So I right. could always get a couple bags of heroin fronted to me. I'd be like, I'll be back in four hours. Usually if you're going to cop, um, a bag of dope if you go with a dollar short they won't give it to you okay. you know yeah. so I, I had a really good reputation on the streets and and I always kept my word right so um, that's how I started my days you know I'd okay let me go get my get my bag of dope fronted and I got need coffee even the McDonald's on Blue Island they used to give yeah. me three cookies and I had a standing really? order Oh yeah, I you know, go. I live next to that McDonald's. Do you? Yeah. yeah. Oh god, I, I dyed my hair in that McDonald's. That's the McDonald's I'm talking about in the book. Yes, yeah, that McDonald's. And um, I uh, anyway, and then I'd go to where Coyotes is. I love Coyotes. Five a.m. Yeah, place. yeah. Well, yeah. it used to be called something else years really? ago. Okay. Um, but it, it was always the restaurant. I can't remember the name of it, but there I could always get um, you know, the eggs and chorizo. Breakfast. There used to be like I, a Nuevo León around there, and then Los Camales. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And the Los Camales, I could always go in. There. I know. I I just went in there for lunch not long ago with a couple <laughs> colleagues. <laughs> they're like, you know, Bianca, cómo está, mamita? Oh, like, yeah? oh yeah, 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 oh, yeah. Right. They're like, right. they're they tell me in Spanish because they I would go in there and and I because they would give me food right and so then when i'd go downtown and steal like high-end perfume or jewelry i'd stop in because i want to be you know like they were kind to me right, right. and i'd be like you know tu gusto esta and they'd be right. like oh si si cuanto no 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 gratis gratis you know so they wow. they would say you know i just give it to them for free you know, because they were kind to me right so now i went in there not long ago and one of them was like tu tienes joyas you know and i'm like no no car no I, I i how do you say that rings anios no Tú tienes años. I'm like, no, no, no más, ru no más rubio or however you say. I don't steal anymore, you know. I tell them, no más drogas. I'm, I'm, I don't do drugs. And so they're all proud of me and they oh, hug right, me and stuff. Right. But but they were all kind to me and they didn't have to be, right? right. You know? Yeah, I love Pilsen. I love Little Village. Um, the, uh, the other place in the book that kind of surprised me was uh, the Shamrock Motel on, on Cicero. Oh, God, the Shamrock so, yeah. I part time work on the fire department at Cicero. Mm. So like I've I've that's one of the more hot spots around, yeah. around town and uh yeah, I was like, What? She used to go to the <laughs> I've been everywhere, yeah. Oh yeah. I can't tell you how many times the police have busted our door down in there, you know? But um yeah, the the shamrock, um yeah, I hung, I well, I mean, we we'd get rooms there for a week until they throw us out. But back in that, in the back in the day, there were there was also the cove was there. It's now just an empty lot. Okay. But um, and the caravan, the okay. caravan's another big one. So like, do you have to go there a lot? No, not the caravan. There, there is another motel. I forgot the. the it's name right down the street from, from from Shamrock. And it's got like you pull in, and it's like a courtyard almost. Yeah. That's the caravan, or do they call it something else now? Oh, I know it. It is. It is called something else. Oh, now. okay. I yeah. know what you're talking okay. about, though. Yeah. Because there should be. I'm sure there's, alarming I, I a number of <laughs> overdoses there, right? Yeah. Yeah, I'm sure there are. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I remember, um, oh, God, yeah, I was always in the in the shamrock. We'd get rooms, you know, whatever. We, we were just all hustling, you know, right. and okay. uh, so bagging dope in, the, in these hotels. The Cindy Lynn. Was, that's the other one. So that's not the Cove, huh? That's not the, that's the, that's the. No, I'm talking about, this, there, so there's so. a Cindy Lynn, but then right down is on Cicero okay. Avenue, yeah. you've got the Shamrock. Then uh -huh. on the same street, a little bit further, is the caravan. Further north or south? Going towards Cermac. Okay. Oh, south. Okay. All right. And then if you go almost to, you know where the title loan thing is? Yeah. All right. So 
there's a the block right before that. There's like kind of a corner okay. where there's nothing there. Okay, they knock something down. That used uh, to be the Cove Motel. Oh, okay, okay. And across the street from there used to be the Hard Rock Cafe, which not what the one you think. <laughs> it was just a, a dive, a dive okay, grill, okay. <laughs> and um, they had two fruit machines in there. The gambling, but oh, but okay, okay. back then there was for entertainment only, yeah. right? And um, that was it, right? But if they knew you and you hit, you know, they'd pay it off, right? That's how, in the olden days, how it worked, you know? Mm. But um, but so they had two fruit machines and some, I remember one time I went in there and, and th- that guy was pretty cool that owned it. And uh, he, he would, all the girls, the, the, the you know, the, the street workers or the drug addicts, whatever, he would always, he'd always, we always have food. He'd give nice. us something to eat. Okay. And every Thanksgiving, he'd put out a whole, Whole, spread, whole, whole spread. Really? We could come in and get free things. All the street people. So he was a really good guy. And um, but I remember when I had two dollars left to my name. I was so dope sick. I was in major withdrawal. I went in there, and I was hungry too. Among everything, I was just like, oh, just just kill me, God, just take me, you know. And I thought, and I'm not a gambler mm-hmm. of all the things that I have been. I'm not a gambler. And so um, I thought, uh. What do I got to lose? It's two dollars. I put the two dollars in, and boom, 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 and all of a sudden I won fifty bucks. You know, so I was, I told them I was like, um, and they're like, they look around, make sure there's no undercovers, you know, <laughs> and they give you the fifty bucks. Yeah. So I called my, I used there was a payphone there. I called my dealer. I ordered something to eat. Waited patiently for my dealer. He came in after like twenty minutes. I bought a twenty-five dollar bag of heroin. Went, went in the bathroom at the little dive place called the Hard Rock Cafe. Shot the dope and went and ate my food and went about my way. Bought a pack no of cigarettes. Way. So it, it was always survival for me, you know. And yeah. somehow things always um, worked, worked out. out. I don't know how, but I just relentless, I guess, you know. Yeah. Um, what do you think the current culture or like state of like gang life is? It's very um, sporadic and like, is there, unorganized. Is there a real meaning behind it? Um, I don't days? think so. Um, I think there's some. No, I mean, like the, the shorties nowadays, um, you know, it's kind of like. Like they do want uh, that sense of belonging, but they're doing it for the wrong, like. For the wrong, wrong reasons. reasons. And it, so much is happening on social media. And, you know, I saw, a, uh, how do you say a meme or meme? Meme. meme? Yeah, I don't, you millenniums. <laughs> but anyway, a meme. And it had like, it was like a cartoon, but of a graveyard with a bunch of gravestones. Mm. And on each gravestone, instead of a name, it had like, you know, the like button, you know, the heart, mm-hmm. and then, uh, or whatever. Like comment and, or the, share. and then comment or yeah. whatever, right? Like, you know. Uh, 400 likes, um, 57 comments, yeah. but they're dead now, right? Yeah. So, like, so are you doing this just to get attention on social media? Right. So, I feel like um, I don't know if it's my generation or something. We really failed this generation. That um, you know, um, gangs. So, my work is not to dismantle a gang. No one can dismantle a gang. Mm. I mean. I maybe I mean I, I don't I haven't met the person who has invented that idea yet right mm-hmm. they've been around for thousands of years and I don't think they're going to go anywhere right but um but we can minimize um who joins and and who is in a gang um how reckless they become right okay. and so um the thing is right now if, if social media plays a huge role if um you know all gang members the majority are friends on Facebook with all their rival gang members. Oh, really? Oh, yeah. Like, like <laughs> I'm, I might be trying to kill you last night, but and we're not friends because we're really friends. It's just you so that to keep tabs. No, that way when I because I'm going to disrespect you and I'm going to tag you. So that way I want to make sure all your all your guys see how brutally I just disrespected you. <laughs> and then all the pages are public, so the whole world can see. And then it starts beefing, right? Because right, I just right, dis- right, dissed right. you and said, you know, that you're a punk, and you know, I'm waiting, come get me, whatever, right? However, they got they got all kind of crazy stuff. Like, ugh. anyway, so now you have to respond. You have to say something. Are you just gonna let them do that, right? But so do you though? They do. And I then know, but like- they reply, and then they they and then it goes into a beef back and forth mm-hmm. uh, on the comments. 
and then your guy, your your guys are chiming in, and the guy who posted it, his guys are chiming in, and then random people who want to, uh, you know, um, rep with whatever gang or the other who aren't even involved, you know, it's like. Stop, you know, this is not what you want, right? But anyway, they chime in. And this, sometimes I sit in my office and I watch like boom, 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 really? boom, 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 boom. And then I obviously am not going to like a post like that. But if it's really out of control and I see the two, you know, guy one and guy two really going at it because of the initial disrespectful post, punking yeah. somebody out, then I might come in. This has happened so many times. Then I come in with a really... Really? Oh. WWW? This is what you want the whole World Wide Web to see? Really? That's all I say, right? And then some random people will say the, um, they'll type the initials to me, you know, sh can I say it? Yeah. Shut the fuck up, bitch, oh, right? Yeah, yeah. Okay, so now both guys, both um, group A and B, guy one and two, I, I have relationships with them. I have a rapport with them. Yeah. So now they're going to come to my aid. So then all of a sudden it turns into they're beef and wanting to kill each other. Then all of a sudden they join forces without even realizing it to come to Bianca's aid, right? Uh, to come to my honor. You know, man, we don't talk to Bianca like that. You know, man. Oh, oh you know Bianca? Oh, I know Bianca. <laughs> no, no, they all know I know them. <laughs> but I'm it's saying like, the random person, whoever know, says, like, shut the fuck up, Bianca, right? Then, or t just tags me in the comments right. and says, shut the fuck up, bitch, right? Yeah. Then all of a sudden you see all these people going, man, Bianca, cool. We don't talk like to her right. like this and all this type of stuff. And then I just sit back and I have to smile because I'm like, okay, that works perfect for me because... They forgot what they were fighting about and, and without realizing it joined forces to stick up for my honor. And then when I see them in person individually, of mm -hmm. course, then I, I razz them about it. I'm yeah. like, wow, did you see how in those couple words I, I shut that whole shit down, right? right. And then right, I was right, like, right. you know, stop Bianca, you know, stay off my page, but they would never <laughs> unfriend me, you know. But um Man. but yeah, there's a lot. So also, um it depends on so also like you know, if you're known to be be, be a shooter, you're going to have more cred. It, it's different. It's not really um, back in the day loyalty earned like it once was. And um, sadly, um, you know, there. I, I believe that it's easier in this day and age, I don't know how to say it um, so people won't take it wrong, but back in my day, you know, it was equal. It was probably even more violent than it is now. Mm. You know, actually, to be honest with you, right? And um, there were way more homicides in the early '90s than there are now, right? And um, but now there's way more shooting victims that survived than back in the day, right? Mm -hmm. So, like last year, we probably had over three thousand people shot, right? And pro so probably twenty seven hundred of them sh were shot and survived, mm -hmm. right? Okay. Back in the day, if you you wouldn't have had if you had three thousand people shot, you would have had twenty five hundred deaths, you know, because it it was more um, like you had to really do something, you know what I mean? It wasn't yeah. just random. Let me just shoot the block up, or you you diss me on social media. I'm gonna shoot at you from a block away, and three innocent bystanders get killed, right? Right. So um, so the thing is like it, when you hear on in Chicago, <clears throat> excuse me, um, saying we're down in homicides and and that is true right but but nobody they i feel like and it pisses me off that's why i don't watch the news because i want to usually throw my coffee cup at my tv and i can't afford to buy a new one so um they don't mention the number of shooting victim people who were shot who survived hmm. right so um and as a matter of fact i'll tell you right now i'll tell you right now this year how many people have been shot and survived because hmm. i actually do data at the University of Illinois. Right. It'll take me one second. And um, it's uh, alarming, right? And I get it that you, you want to make things look good, but I think it's better to be real and say we have a real problem and how do we stop this? And you being, you said you're a paramedic. Okay, so it's 2019. We have really good first responders, better technology, level one trauma centers, uh -huh. right? Um, trauma surgeons, yeah. paramedics, yeah. Um, all that. All that plays a huge role in saving someone's life that we did not have back in 1992, right? 
so I don't know why this is freezing on me. Oh, here we go. So, um, sorry, my phone. No, you're fine. Uh, anyway, but um, so um, from January 1st till now, 1,199 people have been shot, 282 killed, a total of 1,400, I mean, yeah, 1,455 shot, you know, mm -hmm. total with the 282 homicides. So actually that is down from last year. Um, last year I think we ended um, with, uh, I think about 3,000, and I could tell you right now because I'm like all about stats, you yeah. know? Yeah. Yeah, and I mean we're more than halfway through the year, so... Yeah, so actually we're doing better, yes. but um, but still one is um, too many, right? Mm -hmm. And um, we need to do more. And hold on, I'm going to tell you right now. And my phone, sorry. Okay, so last year, 2018, we ended the year shot and wounded was people who got shot but survived 2,466, and total homicides 590 okay. last year. So a total shot were 2,962. Um, so we are down so far. It looks like it. If it's only saying 1,100 were shot mm -hmm. and wounded, right? But it's still we got some months to go. And yeah. uh, and and the and this is going to ramp up because of this humid, hot weather. And um, uh, I often get calls of people saying like. Well, do you think it wasn't so bad because it's been raining, you know, and things like that? And and I'm like, you know, sometimes that's a good time that people would think to go shoot because it's kind of gray out and mm -hmm. not pouring cats and dogs raining, but kind of, you know, darker. You can ease in and out quicker without people seeing you, you know. I don't know. The thing is that I've I've said myself – like, what the hell is wrong? Like, I've told guys, what's yeah. wrong with you? You have a gun. It's like 20 below zero. Doesn't it? It's not freezing to your hand, you know? I'm like, are you kidding me? You know, I, I try to make it in a light way right, without, right, you know, I'm right, not trying right, to right. preach to people because sure. nobody's going to listen to that. No. Nope. They have to want to listen. Yeah, and they don't want to listen to a teacher. Not the, at least the initially. Police. But yeah. you have a good way of connecting with people. Yeah, you have to connect with them. And in, even if I have to say it in a joking way, like, you know, okay, you're pissed. You're going to go get a gun. It's probably going to freeze to your hand because it's 30 below. But okay, you know, and then they're like, they laugh then. And if you could get somebody to laugh a little bit or laugh at themselves in a fun way, you know, it, it kind of deters well, can the... Can you be angry and laugh at the same time? Yeah. Well, not at first. <laughs> oh, but... oh, really, though? Oh, yeah. Really? Well, I, yeah, because then I get all hardcore with them. You know, when I know that somebody's like pissed and they, they want to go retaliate and literally go shoot somebody and there's the, the, like there's nothing you could say to me. That's what they'll say to me. Mm. And I'm like, OK, cool. Well, well, let's go. I'm not you're not I'm not leaving you. I'm staying with you. And I've had guys say to me like eventually they, they end up thinking it's it funny because I literally they start walking and they're like, OK, you don't want to, you know, like, I'm like, look, OK, well, I'm down. You're, I'm not going to let you shoot somebody. Mm. And, and and I guess if you get stopped right now, I guess I'm going to jail for a gun, too. Is that what you want? Because I, I know somewhere on you probably have a gun. You know, I, I don't know for sure, but I'm assuming, you know, or somewhere nearby. So then they get pissed, like, just leave. I, there's nothing you could say to me. There's nothing you could say to me. Right. And then I'm like, OK, cool. So you got a light. I want to light my cigarette. You got a light. You know, and I just, or the car will pull out. I'm like, wait, you got to make room for me. And then they start to laugh then, you know, like, oh, my God, I see you from the more first thing in the morning till late at night. Do you ever go home you know yeah. so but yeah someone can be mad and really pissed and they don't want to hear it and there's nothing you could say to them and they're going to go shoot you know and unfortunately it does happen and someone dies and someone goes to prison or if they don't get caught they eventually end up getting killed or something it always ends badly violence right. always ends badly right so um when they're really pissed and if you can get ahead of that, right? And um, and sometimes I, I I have a loving way of talking hardcore to people, you mm. know. So it's like probably if you said the things that I have said, they wouldn't let you get away oh, with yeah. that. You know what I mean? But I I can because I think the people that I deal with know that I truly care yeah. and um, want the best for them, like family, right? right. Like. I, this so that they're you know I get away with a lot more than than some of even my male colleagues mm -hmm. can get away with right and so um 
when they're really pissed, you just that's when you got to go to work. And sometimes I'm not the the right person mm -hmm. for that individual. I'll call and because I'll know who is the right person. Like mm. if maybe you may have more credibility with this person, mm. right? So I I call someone you know that I work with, and they come drop everything and come, and then I got to back off. You know, if I'm if I'm spinning my wheels and you're still bent on going to pull a trigger, mm -hmm. then let's move to plan b sure. you know right yeah. so there's all, there's always there's all these strategies that we use and they basically like roll off our tongues because we know them and we do them and it's basically things that second nature that we would do anyway yeah. but there is actually a, a strategy to the work that we do um and bit to answer it in a nutshell with the gang thing there right. is no structure there is no real purpose right. other than being popular and I don't know, girls, fast money, you're getting attention, and this whole social media has gotten out of control. If you ever meet Mark Zuckerberg, please let him know I need to talk with him because... Let's just, well, I don't know if you remember, but for about, like this is maybe a month ago, a couple months ago, um, Instagram and Facebook went dark. It, like it wouldn't... Yeah. Up, right? So yeah, like, yeah. I'm just like, when you're when you're talking about them going back and forth on social yeah. media like what if there is no social media <laughs> yeah yeah well here's the thing so i feel like i i i i don't know one day because i am um, yeah i was relentless for the wrong reasons before i'm relentless for the right reasons now and i don't give up on anything mm -hmm. I, i'm in the right i'm not giving up right so but one day i'll get to mark zuckerberg or his wife one of them and um here's the thing I was so pissed off a couple of years ago. I put up a, um, a picture on um, Instagram and um, Facebook of a bottle of Sprite and a bottle of coating cough syrup, right? Mm. The lean, right? The um, they mix. It's like heroin, same mm -hmm. thing, and um, and they mix now lean per whatever you know mud, whatever they call it. They mix the coating cough syrup that gets you high with Sprite and make it look all cutesy and purple and they drink it, right? So it's all cool. That's like a cool thing, right? What? Yeah, they've been doing that for years. But anyway, <laughs> so I tell the guys when I'm with them on the streets, I'm like, oh my God, you guys are such punks. So you're you 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 you're you're fancy pansying it up, you know, like you made it a cool name and and you call it purple and uh, you get sprite and you mix it and then you have your little drink, you know. And then I'm like, man, I was hardcore. When I was 16, I was cracking scrubs for coating cough syrup and drink get in the car, pop the bottle and drink it down right then and there in the parking lot of the of the drugstore right. that I just cracked a that Forge a doctor's name and prescription and, and got the the, wow. the the coding, right? So then they laugh, you know. So I thought, no, I really have to, you know, and I and then I know that young guys, because they're dealing, and I even when I was in the life, I would see this, they're really disrespectful to um uh, heroin addicts, yeah. you know, call, calling names mm -hmm. or clunker, hype, junkie, whatever, right? You know, and so I thought, let me kind of wrap this in to make, I'm not about, you know, my social media is all about a message, right? Mm. And so, um, so I write, I put the little picture up and say, oh, so you gave it a cutesy name and da 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 But just remember one thing, um, uh, when, and trust me, they will happen, when the withdrawals kick in, where, where you feel that death will feel better than what you're experiencing, please give me a call and I'll help you through it. Wow. And in the meantime, in the meantime, when you pass a heroin addict on the street, just know that you're doing the same drug as them. So be, be a little thoughtful when you call them a, a hype, a clunker, um, a junkie, because you're doing the same drug, right? So anyway, my post got shared 35,000 times oh. and it went like viral, right? And Facebook took it down and said that it didn't meet their community standards. I was like, <laughs> You're, you've built a community. Are you kidding I, me? Are you kidding me? I know. I, I was like, I can't even, t I don't even know how many times it was liked, but it was shared 35,000 times. It was liked, I don't know, like it just totally blew up. And I don't know why. It was just a message to some hoping for one young person to read this and go, wow, yeah. this shit is addictive. Yeah. You know what I mean? Maybe yeah. that, oh, that's why I feel like I have a cold. You know, <laughs> my nose is running because I need codeine, right? O opiate. So I, that's all I, why I did that, right? And it wasn't like I was advertising or selling, no, you know, nothing. No, no. So anyway, 
So they take it down. But prior, it was up for about a week and a half or something. Mm-hmm. And this all happened right, almost right. I was like, oh, my God, you know. I was getting calls from mothers and young people, like teenagers, and that called like through Facebook, you mm-hmm. know, or Facebook messages saying, you know, I had no idea, or a mother saying, I found a bottle like this in my kid's drawer. I mean, like I was getting all this nice, yeah. action where yeah. I could help people, right? And they were like, and even young people saying, I drink this all the time. Do you think I'm addicted? I'm like, well, I don't know, honey, but if you don't have it and if your nose starts running and, you know, this and that, look for it. But, you know, con- where do you live? Oh, I live in California or Oregon. And they were like, I was, people were reaching out to me literally from around, around the world. And I'm a go-getter still. Yeah. And I'm going to find a resource or somewhere they can go for help. Wow. So, and then all of a sudden, Mark Zuckerberg's people take it down, you know? And I'm like, oh, okay. But the guy who went live and committed a murder you know, live on Facebook, that yeah. got, that got, that could stay up for a few weeks until the police make them take it down. And I'm like, okay, so clearly Mark Zuckerberg needs to have a conversation with me about how, what to someone, watch for. Someone reported it or something like that. What, well, probably, uh, but right? I mean, well, like, you, know, you could have, they could have been a hater, you yeah. know? Yeah. But, but when you looked at it, you sh- could have, whoever was the investigator should have said, this is all this, good. This girl is trying to give a, ma- I, I didn't swear. I didn't yeah. say anything bad. There was no nothing. It was just a picture of a bottle of Sprite and coating cough syrup. Right. And with the description, nice, long, very descriptive of what this leads to if you drink this. Yeah. This is what happens. And this yeah. is what this really is. You, It might look cute and harmless, but it's really the same thing as heroin, right? Yeah. So if you need help, call me, right? So whoever investigated that should have seen that wow. and not did it, right? Yeah. So the, ever since then, I've been on like on a hunt for Mark. I almost said Mark Wahlberg, <laughs> Mark Zuckerberg. So, um, but yeah, and I feel like you know their, their security team needs. I mean, like so an av- okay, everyday regular people, like when I did, I was just on Annie um, in May um, on an episode of the Untold Story, the Secret Life of a Gang Girl, and um, my piece uh, in that. Um, segment and that our show was about how s- social media um, like violence is initiated escalates online to offline killing and shooting right mm. and so a lot of the um, reviews came back a lot of people were like oh my god I had no idea because a regular person why would you know that you Facebook's yeah. a great thing like like I was able after I put myself in a self-induced coma for 36 years i was able to find my friend from kindergarten you know it's a great thing but there's a whole other side to social media that regular people why would you know you don't behave that way right Mm -hmm. and um i often use the comparison i don't i don't remember his name but the man who um split the atom um and uh, like the hydrogen the heisenberg yeah, so like, so when he, so by him splitting the atom into the molecules, right, mm-hmm. led to the making of the atom bomb, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. That was not that man's intention when he did that. His intention was for science and for study and for energy and whatever, right? So, and he, I, th- I believe he won the Nobel Peace Prize. And um, I believe that man, from what I, can't remember completely but i used to read a lot of encyclopedias when i was in prison so but um like we had a broken heart over that like had a lot of grief because then that technology was used Hmm. for the bomb the bomb yeah of mass destruction right right? and that's not why he split the or you did um work to um you know, in research to right. split the atom, right? That that was not his intention to make yeah. mass destruction, right? So I feel like Mark Zuckerberg, you know, his little school project with his friend or whatever they did, and they made this thing, and all of a sudden it blew up into this great um, technology for people to connect in the moment, in the very second, right? But um, I'm not sure that he really understands. And I, obviously he knows because there's, you know, like a lot of violence and people are talking about people get bullied on social media. So he knows that, but I don't think he knows the real in depth of it, you know? Yeah. That's really interesting. And I I would really like to have a conversation with somebody from Facebook about that. I I would like to be invited to their think tank. I I really would. Okay. Um, So with social media, why can't these kids in gangs why isn't it, it it should be easy for them to see how much opportunity there is out there they're not looking 
they're not looking. So if you live in an, in an, in an area, right? Let's say, let's just say you live in Englewood, right? Yeah. Okay. Let's say you live in, like recently, um, it hasn't aired yet, but I did a podcast with a girl from New York. Okay. And, um, and basically we kind of went, I brought her into the hoods and it was kind of more than a podcast. But like she it, visited or? She came to Chicago. Oh, okay. Yeah. And, um, so right around, I brought her to like Madison and Pulaski through that area. Right. So I said to her, okay, I'm just going to drive around. This used to be my neighborhood. Tell me, okay, you have a six year old little girl and an eight year old little boy. You tell me, we're just going to drive and let me know where you feel that they'd be safe to go play. Okay. The liquor store. Okay. What about that field right there that we don't, it's so overgrown that mm. we can't cut through it. Okay. What about the abandoned building? How about there? Oh, there's another abandoned building. Wait. Okay. Another liquor store, beauty supply, dollar store, you know, currency exchange. Yeah. Currency exchange. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, let, we're, we're, where are we going to And then she was like, oh, my God, there aren't any parks. I'm like, no, you're not going to find any. I go, I do know of one. I go, I'm, I'm going to drive you past that. So we drive past in the same area, like way in the back, right? Just like, you know, how the, the, just actually just a little park for kids. The grass was as tall, like probably five feet tall. Like you, I wouldn't walk in there because probably rats through there, right? So um, I did take her, like there's Sumner School, right there on on fifth right off of costner so mothers could take their kids there you know to, to go on the swings there's actually you know a little playground behind the school but the violence is so bad so you're not gonna i mean it's just like it's just really bad for kids so so if you're if you're growing up in there in that area and that's all you see what are you learning right you're yeah. not learning anything you're not and 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 the schools you know, our, um, I know that we have great teachers that really care. And, yeah. I, and I go into a lot of Chicago public schools to speak, grade school and high schools. And I know I, I meet so many, you know, the Teach for America people. Mm -hmm. And I, I, so I, you know, I've spoke to all those people and conferences and things. And they really care, but they're so overwhelmed with so many huge classrooms and not enough teachers. And you know, not enough resources even within the schools, you know, like, yeah. I mean, we, we have to do better. We have to do better. We have to, um, we have to fix our own communities. Right. We can't rely on the city to, on to the start city. fixing things. Right, yeah. exactly, right. So I know um, I have, um, I've done this in, this is years ago, I haven't done it lately, and I'm thinking now that, I, it just came to my head now, I should do this uh, on Pulaski and Fifth in that area and just try to organize volunteers and let's just walk around and pick up the, the, the empty um, beer cans and empty whiskey bottles and the empty bags of heroin and, 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 and you know, let, let's, let's uh, you know, I, I'll donate it. I got a lawnmower. I don't even know how to use it, but I'll figure it out, right? I mean, let's just clean it up. Clean, let's start block by block, right? Maybe yeah. I'll do that. But I have done that in, in Rogers Park with um, Ralph Edwards. We call him Snoop and my other team um, mates up there. And it's always real successful. And we get guys who are involved in high-risk street activity. Hmm. They got to take a little pride in, you know, where they volunteer. And it's like... I don't know. Like maybe they get that look. Like somebody respects me, right? Yeah. Have you heard of that that big group? It's growing. Um, recently, the my run by Jamal Cole. Oh yeah. Right. Yeah. So like he's he's providing opportunities for his group, and showing them that there's more to just the city. Yeah. Than the South Side. Than than currency exchanges. Yes. yes. And parks that are overgrown with weeds and whatnot. And yes. And so he's doing his part in. And showing them like, hey, you you are allowed to go downtown. Hey, you can go and get Vietnamese food up north. Like, there's right. so much more opportunity out there that these kids never realize. They don't know, and they can be something. Yes. they can be someone. Yeah. So I get a lot of. I'm I, I'm still I'm still a hustler. I just do it for the greater right. good. So I'm constantly hustling for any kind of tickets to be donated to mm. me for whether sports games. Mm. Um, uh, John Hancock Center, mm. um, museums, you know, Chicago museums, um, plays, musicals. I just, um, the auditorium theater is now going to start giving me, I think, 60 tickets, I think, for maybe four or five shows mm. a season. 
I um, have to meet with the lady next week. I just connected. I have the Black Ensemble Theater. They always donate tickets to um, theater, the John Hancock Center, the top, the, to go on the tilt. Just to see the view of the city from it's and it's, so it's life changing. It it is. And the first time, so oh, and I and um, I'm not gonna lie. The fir- I got free tickets to the Field Museum uh-huh. once, right? And yeah. I thought, okay, I'll just pay out of my own pocket and rent a van, right? Yeah. And I'm because it was only 25 tickets, right? So I'm gonna bring a couple of my colleagues, right? Right, right? And and young guys, right? Like you know, high risk guys, right? Sure. Yeah. So I thought, okay, cool. So they didn't they didn't want to hear it. You could only imagine, right? And and they were like, are you out of your fucking mind you know we're, why would we go like we're not in fifth grade we're not going to the field museum right. so i'm like no i swear to god but i'm fun i'm not the teacher right i'm not the teacher i'm fun we'll have fun right we'll go to mcdonald's we'll eat then we'll walk over right, you right. know we're gonna park the van blah blah so anyway the only way i could get them to go is if i said i had to make a deal with them and i do this often and i so i i, I said okay i'll make a deal with you if you don't laugh what well, I will give you at the end of the day. I will give you ten dollars, right? And if at during that time we're there, not one time do you smile, you don't laugh, you're totally miserable. Where you're just like, oh, I can't wait till this is over. You don't joke at all. You don't laugh at one of my stupid jokes. Nothing. You, then I will give you ten dollars, right? Well, I didn't have to pay anybody because we had fun, and they were actually like, hey, when are we going to see the mummies again? Like right. it was, was kind of like life changing for them to to right. actually see going down their little exhibit with the mummies and yeah. the dinosaurs. And another time, I got tickets to the Marvin Gaye um, oh, nice. show. No, well, at the Black Ensemble Theater, right. the, their, their musical, right? So I, I, I had 30 tickets and I, some colleagues and some guys, right? And they were very, I don't have to go through this anymore. This is years ago. And, I, and they were like, no, hell no, we're not trying to go see no stupid shit like that, you know? So <laughs> then I'm like, okay, I'll make a deal with you, all right? If you, during the time that we go to to this musical, if you don't, if I don't see your foot move, snap your finger, mm. any kind of anything, you don't do anything at all, I'll give you $10. Okay, good deal. It's only an hour and a half. You know, I'm like, yeah, not bad, you know. So, but then they always get into, they're like, oh, this is old people music. I remember my grandmama used to, you know, so <laughs> it's like funny, right? So then, but by me getting, breaking that ice, right, they go back right, to the right, hood right, and go, right. no, I swear to God, man. <laughs> it this, was cool. <laughs> yeah, this was cool, man. And so like now I'm like known as like, I, I'm, I'm moonlighting for, for, for Ticketron or something, you know? So um, I, I literally have families call me. Um, I don't even like sports. Yeah. I, I know I, I. I go to games to interact, be with the, you know, people I bring. Um, I know I was at a Cubs game once, and all your Cub fans are going to start laughing right now, but we were in the bleachers. I think I got like 100 tickets. I brought all these people. Wow. And um, I don't know, I'm not a sports fan. I don't know anything about stuff like that, right? So uh, somebody, ri- all these people are cheering, you know, with home runs and stuff. And, um, and then another home run got hit, and so I'm thought, okay, we'll participate, right? So I'm like, wow, like crazy. And then some man goes, lady, you're gonna get beat up up in here. And I'm like, wait, what? And then the the guy, that, these kids were like, that's the wrong team, you know. And I'm like, oh my god, I'm sorry, boo, you know. So <laughs> it was too funny. But anyway, but I go, and and then the Bulls, they give me tickets, nice. and even if they have. Um, Last season, they had um, player suites that they weren't being used. Mm. I were twenty people. I'll, I'll, you know, I'd pick that, a, a group that like a family or you know like that. So yeah, it always works out really well. But I, but but the most thing that really is life changing that when I first bring some of these young people with me um, downtown, and maybe they're in my car with me, right and. The way they're on Snapchat, like you would think I brought them to the Virgin Islands, you yeah. know. I mean, like it's they're so lo- novel to them. They're looking at Michigan Avenue and like on Snapchat and Instagram right. Live, and right. you know. And then and then I had fun when I brought uh, I brought like well, <laughs> I don't know about ten guys with me to the top of the giant Hancock, wow. and then so we had the tickets for free, but you have to. I had to pay for the tilt, so it's but it's only like an extra five bucks or something. So I was like, come on, and they're and um. <laughs> 
I had already did it, but I would have did it anyway. I have no fear like that. And so um, they're like, oh, hell no, we're not going on that. And I'm like, really? Oh, but you're you're badass, right? Okay, cool, no problem. So when I get back to the hood, I am I am going to punk you out, you know, and then they start laughing. They're like, no, I'm like, you. so you're all, you're all badass, but you can't, you, nothing's going to happen. And they're like, all right, all right we're, we're going to go. Like I kind of like you know guilt them into it you know yeah. but well we have so much i have so much fun with young people yeah i totally they do probably like six flags they probably like great, great america yeah yeah know. if i could get tickets right? i would bring yeah. them there yeah absolutely um what else can we do what else do they need to to kind of shake them out of this like i need to be in a gang like what else can we sh- can so we do I, for them? I i like to try to like my job you know is more focused um With like the age group, like say 16 to 25, really Mm. high risk. High risk would be considered um, somebody um, at risk for shooting or being shot day by day, right? Okay. But I, so obviously, you know, I focus on that, but um, I work my eight hours. I don't, I could go home. I don't, Mm. right? So I built, still build other relationships with like younger people or their families. I want to see what are their root causes. Everyone has a different root cause, right? right? And so like, what kind of a life do they have at home? Do they need somebody to mentor them? I think that a lot of kids um, really need, like, so like you got the Boys and Girls Club, you know, they don't, not everyone has access to community centers. Like you would think they did, but they're really far and they may have to go through three different rival gang areas and and the kid who's 10 might not be in a gang, but his older brother is. So now he's judged, right? Mm. And so, and it's just not right. You know what I mean? So and I'm not saying that the city should build a community center on every corner, but, but what I am saying is us as a community need to figure this out, right? What, how, what is the, the safest way we can get young kids, whether it's in schools, maybe some after school programs at the school, right? And um, because I know there was a lot of problems with, um, you know, busing kids to different schools Mm -hmm. and um, and they got the safe um, passage workers and all that stuff. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. So, I mean, like, that's still, you know, it's all good. And I think it looks a little better on the outside than, than it really is. Those people actually do work really hard and try to, you know, protect the children. But some things are out of the reach of you protecting them. Do you know what I mean? So yeah, but is there is there anything we can do to instill a sense of purpose or hope? Yes, you have to find. I always tell um, parents, or if it's a single mom or the older brother, whoever, we have. Everyone has something deep in their soul, yeah. but they just don't dig deep enough to find it. So some some like I think that with me with when I was a child, I was always very like I told you, I'm very visual. I I. I make a whole picture in my head, a whole thing. Um, I'm very artistic. I am an artist. I do paint. I draw. Um, I musically, I'm not. I I could have. I play a little couple songs by ear on the piano. So I don't play the piano, but I could have learned. Mm. I had the potential, right? Um, I think that if I were exposed to more arts education, art arts like edu- education like that I think that would have focused my interest a little mm. better right instead of being so crazy and just let me hitchhike to, to California right yeah so with kids these days I think that we have to find out what you have to find out from them we can't make the decision for them no for sure right do you know what I mean but they probably don't have that opportunity but they don't even know to look at that they don't even know like let, I mean it is what it is and, and people will argue with me all day like don't tell me I know so and so but yeah. Got got out of the projects and became a lawyer, and you know, okay, well, that happens to one out of every thousand kids, you know. So, I mean, some kids just accept what 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 they're given, and and they just try to. They're in survival mode at five years old. And you, you shouldn't know? have to be. You shouldn't have to be. No. So, I think that if we as people and the communities, and if you're a community organizer or even just an everyday person, if you see a kid. And, and, and I'm not like a bleeding heart, you know what I mean? I'm not like a bleeding heart, like just give the whole store away, right? Mm-hmm. I prefer to um, build a rapport, teach, help, lift you up, inspire you, you know, and, and, and help you learn mm-hmm. and help you find your way, right? Mm-hmm. 
I can't tell you which way to go, right? But I can help you find what you want to do, right? Yeah. By trying to inspire you. So, um, and anyone, anyone, like, People, regular people are not going to go into the hood and do what I do. Right. I understand that, nor would I ask anybody to do that. But just a, a simple, kind word to to a, to a kid, yeah. you know. Um, some of these kids are just, um, you know, that they, they look at you like, because I I've I've stopped my car before in the winter. Like I, I keep, like I'm like a thrift store in my car. Mm -hmm. Like I take all people do, donate like brand new coats to me. I keep in my car all. I'll start getting coat donations in, in like September, and I just keep them in my trunk in my car in the back seat. There's all everyone's always, always laughs if, if they Good ask me you. ask me for a ride because I'm like, okay, wait, hold on, let me rearrange. So I I've had kids where I'm just driving to work. It's freezing out, and they got a hoodie on, right? And um, I'll stop my car. I'll pull over. And I go, hey, 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 hey. I jump out the car. I probably, I mean, I don't know. I don't know if you should be doing that. Yeah, I know, no, but I do it. I do do it. I'm like, hey, 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 baby, do you need a coat? You need a coat? I got brand new coats. I think I think I got one that'll fit you. And they kind of look at me like, whoa, you know, like, you know, and then they like, I, but right away I pop the trunk and I'm like, look here. I mean, there's no, no, nothing. There's no strings attached. You know, why, why don't you have a coat? And they'll be like, well, I'm, you know, I, I lost it or someone stole it or I couldn't afford it or whatever. And then I'm like, well, here, you just take it. That'll fit you. Take it. Brand new coat. Take it. And they're like, oh, okay, thanks, you know, and that's it. So that's, I do that all the time. Um, I every um, I, I, I have a real um, caring for, well, for the all of humanity, but for little kids who are homeless in Chicago, mm. you know, and on Christmas every year, I, I work relentlessly to, to get gifts and wrap them yeah. and go to the shelters and under bridges. So my Christmas Eves are not spent with my family. They're spent on the streets of Chicago with children and young adults, not, not really young adults, but like minors, you know, like yeah. toddlers from babies to mothers who are in shelters or battered women's shelters or even um, children that live with their a parent that in ten cities, you know, yeah. and um, I go ahead of time, like I go in about the beginning of November, and I go and I talk to kids and I tell them, and he, and some of them get a kick out of it because they know there's no Santa Claus, you know, like a twelve year old kid, right? And then I'm like, okay, so you know, I'm like really good friends with Santa, and, <laughs> and then they're like, okay, and I'm like, so I'm a, I actually have a meeting with him tomorrow, so I need I need your name and tell me two things that you would want from Santa Claus, and then they give me two things, right? And then. I make sure I do this at many shelters and under the bridges and all type of places and even fan, I have uh, over the years I do it every year so I have adopted like some families that are very poor and um, anyway if I raise enough money then they can get both gifts mm -hmm. and then or if not they just get the one but it's actually wrapped nice mm. with their name on it from Santa Claus right yeah. so I never want to see a child have to um and i know the churches do a good job trying to help for the christmas dinner and things like that right and they give kids gifts you know boy 12 girl 11 you know i don't i wouldn't want that and i i don't so that's my goal you know i don't want to see a child have to be that depressed already their life is so messed up you know they're 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 eight and now they got to get some um little rap thing that says boy eight you know right. so i i try to avoid so over the year i do it every year i've been doing it for some years and every year it kind of gets bigger and bigger and and i'm grateful to other people that the donors and people who helped me rap and because it started getting out of control where i was like can't, shopping can't be a one man one man well, there's anymore. no way no like the <laughs> second year i'm like in walmart and I'm like, I'm laughing because I literally had three carts in Walmart. And, and I spend any, I do a GoFundMe page, and then I get also people will say, hey, give me a, a, 10 names. I'll just buy the gifts and give them to you. Okay, cool, you know. But um, the second year, I, I was in Walmart, and I, I, I buy the wrapping paper out of my own money. I buy the tags. I use my own money for gas. I use every dime that's donated for a gift for a child, right? So, but anyway, I'm in Walmart with three um, shopping carts, trying to navigate them, pulling them, pu going off my list, right? 
And remember, I didn't raise my children, so I don't really know about toys, you know, and I didn't shop. So I'm like, thank you, God. I, I see this is karma. So, like, I felt like that second year, I did 18 years of, worth, of shopping. worth of Christmas <laughs> shopping for a kid, you know. So it was so crazy. And now <laughs> it's so crazy because they come up. I don't pay attention to the toys. I, my, my life's like, oh, I, I don't really watch TV. Um Last year, when I did it last Christmas, I kept seeing on the list, you know, I want to, like a six-year-old, seven, five-year-old, I want an SOS doll. And I'm like, oh, okay, well, tell Santa, I'm, you know. And then, so I get home and I'm Googling, what the hell is an SOS doll? I don't even know what that is, right? Yeah. And the year before it was um, a, a Laura, a Lara, I don't even know, all these crazy names of dolls that come out, right? And so I'm now, uh, this past Christmas when I was, I thankfully had my good friend Rose and, and her daughter Alicia and Melissa and like other volunteers, my um my uh, Joan Roberts, she always, you know, volunteers and she takes care of the um we go shopping and she takes care of the battered women's shelter. Mm -hmm. So it's it's a group effort now. But um I'm telling you, I if I'm when I'm shopping, I'll I I'll be in whatever Target or wherever whatever store I go to. I literally am stopping random moms with their kids Christmas shopping. You know, I'm like, um, excuse me, can I borrow your daughter for just one second? Because I have no idea what an SOS doll is, you know? <laughs> like, and they're like, oh, okay. I'm like, this is for charity, and I'm, I'm shopping. Here's my list. You know, Do you know where I can get any of this stuff? And they're like, oh, the little kids. I, I'm, last year, the, these cutest little girls, they were, like, young. And the, and the mom even got all into it. She was like, oh, it's such a great thing to do for, for the kids, you know, yeah. that are homeless. And so she stopped shopping for herself to help me shop, do the list because I literally was clueless with all these new names of toys, right? Oh, wow. And even the boys have these crazy car things, and I'm like, oh, my God, but... But and and then I spend all Christmas Eve. I start early in the morning, on Christmas Eve morning, driving. I start with the families that I've you know bought for for their children, and then I go down the list. I start like way in the like South Shore, make my way yeah. up, go up north. I, there's a family in Evanston I help. Then I go on the West Side. Then I go to the shelters, and then if there is any um, le leftover, like there's one really big shelter that I go to with that's um, run by Good News Partners, and um, it's in Rogers Park, um, Polina and Howard, and um, my longtime friend Ernesta Williams is the director, and she has overcome a lot like I have, and she's just a wonderful person now, and has dedicated her life to those kids, or like her children, but anyway, um, you know, uh, I I will have the huge football pizza sent there. Mm. Like I'll I time oh, everything, nice. and then we go there. We make a big thing of it, and all the kids sit down. And I, uh, we Rose last year bought the big red bags that Santa would carry. You know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Over yeah, here. yeah, yeah, yeah. And we were like, Santa couldn't make it, but we're here. We are. And then it was like cool to keep calling their names. And Alicia was call her daughter was calling the names, and 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 last year we I. We all hustled, but I hustled extra hard, and each child got like three and four gifts. Wow! Like they've not like Ernesta was like, "Oh my God, Bianca, you outdid yourself." I'm like, "Oh God, now I got to do better next uh. year." <laughs> but by then, hopefully, there have been placed in housing. You know, by then. Yeah. But but yeah, so we we have to do more to find out. So so the opportunity, like we know, you and I know there's a lot of opportunity. I didn't always know that. I do now, right? Yeah. I know there was opportunity. I got to go back to college, right? Yeah, yeah you're almost done, right? Yeah, I'm about to get my bachelor yeah. degree in inner city studies. Okay. But I'm saying when I was out in the streets, and of course I went down to hell, but I never believed there was going to be a way out for me. Like I just, like I, I sometimes would wake up and I didn't care if I lived or died. I'd be like... What's really yeah. god I, we have to do this again right. do we have to go through this again today you know yeah. so like i didn't care if i lived or died but um but it's sad to see five and six year olds kind of thinking that way mm. and they're they have no drug problem right and they're, they're they've done nothing wrong right yeah. they've made no bad choices right so um i know that there are some good folks out there that are doing wonderful work independently of organizations or trying to build organizations um to uh, community organizers 
that are working, you know, whether it's with the community or the city to change policy. I do a lot of um, volunteering um, and political campaigns as far as to, you know, to have a voice with um, about policy change. I've testified in Springfield for the, the opiate mm. um, epidemic and how big pharma said like this was going to be the solution right yes. big pharma was like okay well anyone who we identify as having a past drug problem when they're being released from prison on parole we'll make that a stipulation that, we, that they have to go on suboxone or methadone right so i'm like wait are these people serious you know like the prison's already been clean now for three years but now you're going to give them methadone right so i went to springfield and i testified in front of the um, public safety, um, not, or no, that wasn't, I don't think public safety, but appropriation hearing. And um, I told them, no, I used to be on methadone. I still mm. did heroin, and I still overdosed, yeah. right? So that that's absolutely absurd, right? Um, recovery is better. Recovery is better than, well, it's the same as diabetes. Let me just give you um, methadone. I don't, I'm not for that, right? If you need methadone to get off heroin, then yes, I'm for that, right? But not, if you're already clean, just say, well, just make sure, we don't want you to die, right? That's so, weird. That's really weird. So I don't think they got passed, but that's what they were trying to do. Yeah. Um, in order to get Medicaid or Medicare, or whatever the public right. aid um, is uh, pays for, um, for um, uh, like treatment, right? So that was gonna be their their solution to the state paying for treatment by putting you on long-term methadone or suboxone. When really, if you just put them like place like Safe Haven is actually free, you know? And um, I mean, I don't know. Safe Haven was a life changer for me. Can you, so why, how are people um, in these homeless situations, like how, is it because there not, aren't enough shelters? They're, they're all full? Like, no, we don't want to go to shelters. We don't care about them. Some people do. So I, a, I never went to a it's shelter. It's a choice to be homeless sometimes. Um, maybe initially, something that no one's ever saying. Well, actually, that when I was out west in the last few years, I met a group of young millenniums that thought that was cool to be homeless okay. and jump trains and sightsee, whatever. Actually, they seem like trust fund babies. Even you though know? it's like survival every day. You know? Yeah, like but, what? but actual homelessness, nobody's right. saying Nobody's saying like, you know, I think I'm just going to be homeless. It's just like you go down this path and then you, it ends bad. And I don't care how much of a hustler and how great of a drug dealer or whatever your thing was and how much of money you hustled and made, it always ends bad. You always end up with nothing alone and you don't care if you live or die, right? And and if you have a drug problem, that that's all you're left with is, is yeah. the addiction, right? So I never said, oh, yeah, you know, I never believed it that. I would have laughed at you if you had ever told told me one day you're going to be homeless and living in an abandoned building, mm -hmm. you know, or trying to get in, a, in an abandoned building to sleep and get out of the wind, even though it's cold in there. And I would never have believed you, right? But but that is what happened. And um, I never went to a shelter, and I always kind of felt like I never slept on park benches or anything like that. But I mean, I always could find someone's um, couch to sleep on or an abandoned building make kind of, we, squatters, apartments, and stuff like that. But um, I, I would never, I could have been freezing. I wouldn't have gone to a shelter. What about it? What about well, it? I felt like there's bugs. The and it's in, the, like, in the shelter? Yeah, there's like bed bugs. Bed bugs? And oh, people okay. steal. And you got to sleep in a room with a whole bunch of people. And sometimes you don't have a bed. And it's like, well, why go through all that? I can go squat in this place that look, looks like an apartment. And it's actually warm. And I can get high while I'm there, you know? So... Yeah, a lot of people, I do know people who w would go to shelters, but with that, you have to be there at a certain time. Some of them you have to pay for too, right? Some, yeah. and then, but like a regular, just like like Pacific uh, Mission Gar yeah. Garden, whatever it is, um, you have to be there at a certain time. You're going to wait in the line, and they let somebody in, and you know what I mean? Yeah. So that's like too much effort for a person that's lost to the streets. Wow. Like, you got to really, I mean, I would never have did that. Huh. There's no way I would have waited in a line. So if they don't have enough effort they don't have enough effort to go to pacific gardens why would they go to safe haven then well because safe haven you don't have to leave every day you actually are assigned a room and so so there's a difference the shelter 
okay, you, you go to the shelter. You have to yeah. be there at night. You have to be there by 7 or 8, whatever right. it is, right? And you have to be out of there by 7 in the morning right? or whatever time it is. I don't know the exact time. And then you can come back the next night, but you're out all day. And there's no kind of wraparound services, right. okay? So but Safe Haven, there's wraparound services. You, you go into Safe Haven. You are assigned a room to other people, clean. You have sheets, comfortable bed. I mean, it's a single bed, mm-hmm. but it's comfortable. Mm-hmm. You have your own dresser. This, you have the same room. It's not like you're getting a different room every day. You don't have to check out. They have wraparound services. They're providing you therapy. They're providing you, if you have a drug problem, they're providing you, um, you know, like um, drug treatment as far as like counseling for, you know, like you'll, you'll, they'll put you in that kind of a group for, you know, uh, however many weeks, eight weeks or something like that. Um, you have a case manager. Um, that's going to help you. What, what do you need? That actually, how I started getting to get to my um, driver's license, mm. right? Um, I still lived at Safe Haven when that happened. Um, before I got my driver's license, they have a connection with the state of Illinois um, Secretary of State, mm-hmm. where they can. It's like a homeless letter for the person, and if they are able to identify that it's your actual real name. Um, where you don't have all those barriers. Mm-hmm. Sorry, no, you're good. you don't have all those barriers where. You, you could go get it, use that paper that they sign at Safe Haven and go get a state ID. I gotcha. So, but if you don't have that, do you have an idea how hard, hard it is for a, for a, for a straight person? I didn't know. Yeah. To to get an ID, right? So, um, but at Safe Haven, they remove that barrier. Mm-hmm. It's one removed, right? Now it's one another removed. They actually have a culinary arts program there, mm-hmm. that, and they. Um, and a landscaping one too. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. But but the culinary arts. Is it's like like very like all the people that graduated their program like work in their cafeteria. Yeah, they have really good food there. I'm not kidding you. I mean, like the um, it. oh, you have yeah. okay, so you know, so it's really good food, right? Yeah. And um, and it's kind of balanced, and there's like a dessert, and there's like I mean, I'm like, oh my god, like yeah. when I, I I usually go there every Thanksgiving and volunteer, and this last Thanksgiving, um. Because I, I I always know half the people because I've been in prison with everybody right and so um, that I'll sit at the at the um, tables you know for a second and go mm-hmm. like, give somebody a hug and then I'm like oh my god does that look good and they're like here go get you a plate I'm like yeah I'm I'm not allowed because I'm not a resident here mm-hmm. you know so I'm not I'm I would not, I'm not the type of person I'm sure. not going to take away from some of, to feed a mouth of somebody else right but I'm always like oh my god that it looks so good, good for right. Them, huh? So, um, so if you are in this life and you're all fucked up and you made a million wrong choices and you joined a gang and now you're getting older or you, or you, or you just want to get, you know, even if you're 25 years old and you're in, in, uh, in court, right? And, and you got caught with a gun and maybe the judge is going to say, well, I'll put you on house arrest and, and it's your first time and let's see what happens, Right. I tell that person, ask the judge to send you on house arrest to safe haven, you know, because I, that person's going to get wraparound services, right? And they, they have a deal. Uh, not There's a, some, like, accountability wanna... there? Oh, yeah, they, they had to stay there. They're on house arrest. So yeah. you could go to house arrest at home, which at some point, I mean, I used to cut my house arrest bands off. As soon as the sheriffs left after they put me in house arrest, I'd wait five minutes, cut the band, and I was out of there. Catch me when you catch me. You know, I mean, I didn't care. And I couldn't for the life of me understand how these people kept giving me house arrest. You know, I was like, they're like, do you want house arrest? Yeah, sure. You know, yeah, no problem. I'll be, I'll be out in the street. I'll be, I'll be in the corner by midnight, you know. So, um, but a Safe Haven has an um, agreement with the uh, Cook County Sheriff's Department where I forget some kind of um, housing thing. And um, if the judge orders that, the um, uh-huh. house arrest, then if they fit that criteria, that the Cook County Jail has to determine the criteria, then they can send them to Safe Haven. Safe Haven has a, the, a whole floor for male and female mm-hmm. of um, detainees on house arrest at Cook County Jail. And they they have to stay there, and they're, they can't just, I mean, they have to stay at Safe Haven. Sure. They go down. They get that. They eat that great food, right? right Three right, right, meals right, a day. Right. They can have coffee in their room. I mean, it's more of a um, independent living without being independent living, kind of. Oh. Like um, in my when I was a resident there, I had um, 
a coffee a coffee pot that mm-hmm. made four cups, a little coffee mm-hmm. pot. I had a little a little TV this big, like a little seven inch TV, and right, you know, you have to put your earplugs in. But I, I mean, it was cool. I, I was like, it was it, yours. It was mine. It yeah. was mine, and I still, till this day, have that little TV. My little mm-hmm. granddaughter asked if she could borrow it, and I told her no, never. Like I can never. I, I'm a collector now. I have to remember. I have on my dresser the first bottle of perfume. It's empty that I bought with actual money from working, and I have the last bottle of perfume that I stole from Marshall Fields. Oh, wow. Or May, it was Macy's. When Marshall Fields, yeah, right. Yeah, it was Macy's. <laughs> yeah. But, but I'm saying, and I, okay. but I have the two empty bottles, and my kids are always, when they come to my room, like, Ma, why do you got these empty bottles? And I, I tell them the story. I, I never want to forget where I come from. I look at there I stole, probably went to jail, here, I bought it. It's empty. I used it. I still have the bottle, right? Mm. So, but anyway, so um, I think that with safe, safe Haven is completely different. And anyone who was ever thinking, if I ever become rich, I, actually some of the proceeds of my book does go directly to Safe Haven and um, a percentage. Um, and um, and then in addition to if I ever make money on the book, I, out of my own money, will donate more to Safe Haven mm-hmm. um, because I, I wholeheartedly believe in that program. They, um, if you need your GED, the Africa GED classes, um, after you're there for so many months, and then, so we're, we're not hireable people, right? Yeah. So, so um, Nelly Vasquez Roland, the president and co-founder, is also an uh, what's the word uh, entrepreneurship mm-hmm. so um she's she has created companies within safe haven so then she can hire the people right and pay them a decent wage and then they can save their money because the safe haven never going to charge you i lived there even while i was working for ceasefire okay like i were like i think i worked there for like four months saved my money kept saving 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 my little fifteen dollars an hour, which was not little. I mean, it's even good now, right? But I was like, I kept saving, um, and I got my own apartment, right? Yeah. So they never asked me for a dime. Um, but um, if she hires you, like you know, if you work and you go through their classes or, or the um, pest control, they have pest control, landscaping. Um, you can you you work, you save your money, then you can get um, you can rent from one of their affordable buildings. Yeah. I mean, it's like complete wrap around. Mean, like it's right. it's a no brainer, right? And um, and the thing is, like with um, Safe Haven, is that um, they, I don't know, you, you you begin to feel like a real family. Like uh, now you have a real belonging. Right, so, right. Uh, going into a shelter every night, you have to leave the next morning, and then you're like, now what do I do? Right. So what do you what where do you what do you think people like us are gonna do? We're gonna go commit a crime, we're gonna go get high. Yeah. What else do you got? Right. Is there there's no catch at Safe Haven? You don't have to do certain things, you don't have to take these classes. Well, yeah, you have to participate so in the you program. Have, so if and if you don't they then they kick you out? Well they won't really kick you out, but they'll tell you you'll get a couple ch- chances. Sure. You know. They'll yeah. they'll tell you like um yeah, you know, like when I didn't want to wash the window, you yeah. know? <laughs> they were like right, right. We're all okay, well, what do you want? Paper or plastic? And I'm like, for what? And they're like to pack your shit in because mm. obviously you don't want to be here, you know? And I'm like, okay, I'm washing the window, right? So um, they do have, you don't have to take all their classes. You can, um, there, there's a period where you don't get like freedom, like a couple of weeks if you go there to be in the program, right? Whether it's, it, well, house arrest, you can't go anywhere. But if you parole there on parole, of course you have to stay in within your stipulations with your parole agent. And, um, but if you're just like a homeless person or you just want help and you just came out of detox or something and you went through treatment and whatever, you want to go there. So, um, you'll stay there for like, I think a week or two before they give you a pass, but then you could start saying, I'm going to go out and look for a job every day. And then you can go look for a job and they'll even try to help. Um, like in reality, safe haven is the reason my Yahoo email, that's where I got that email from, from their computer lab. When I didn't even know how to turn a computer on, you know, so, and I still have this, and I and I wish somebody would have told me back then, because now it's I can't I can't change my e- my email, and Just I make mean, another one. <laughs> no, you can't because I have millions of people contact me, right? I gotcha, yeah. Yeah, so and it's like Angelia Bianca number two you at Yahoo. So it's like I'm, I hate to type that long ass thing, and it's like on the phone with people and they're, I'm like, A-N-G-A, you know, it's like crazy, right? So 
my advice to all your viewers, if you're making a, your email and you want to use it for a long time, make it as simple as possible, you know? So I wish I could have had just like Bianca at gmail.com, right? But yeah. um, but anyway, so um, but Safe Haven has a computer lab. They have classes. If you don't want to take them, you don't have to. Really? But you have to do something. What? So, what, I mean, what's that? What's the turnoff when I, because I've, I've, and you, I'm sure too, referred Safe Haven to many people. And mm -hmm. it's like, but why? And they're like, nah. Like, but why? Because they don't want to live by rules. Oh. See, we think that they do because we're okay now, right? Or you, I, I know. Right. I didn't want to. Uh, but, and here they are like panhandling on the streets. Right. Yeah. Some are never going to come off the streets. Okay. Some are never. I always give my card. If I do give a dollar, I give my card. Mm. Sometimes I don't have any money at all. I give a card and a cigarette, you mm. know? Uh, if, if nothing else, I stop. I, I don't want anybody to be invisible, right? Right. So right. I, I actually will say, I'm sorry, baby, I don't have any money, right. you know? And then I'm like, you want a cigarette? You know, if I have a banana, yeah, I got a banana, you know, whatever, something like that. But there's some people, they're never going to come off the street. And, when huh. we, and, and I, I run into that a lot. Let me call Safe Haven. You know, I can get you in Safe Haven. Is, is it because they don't, they don't, they're not hopeful? They don't have hope of like a potential different no, future for not, themselves no they probably do and i'm sure that i i know many um people who are probably getting in their 40s and have been out there for quite a long time and pretty much know and have seen others get out and make it and the that disease of, of the drugs i mean the drugs really i mean it's like a, a real beast for real you mm -hmm. know and that's why i try to educate younger people with the with the pills and the coating cough syrup I and mean, i mean like like that's how I started, you know. Yeah. I was basically drinking codeine, cough syrup, taking pills at nine, you know. So, I mean, the thing is, um, a person has to be ready, or you have to at least want to try. Mm -hmm. They say you can only lead a horse to water; you can't, can't make, make them drink. drink. Right. I say, but I'm going to try to make the horse thirsty, so the mm -hmm. horse wants to drink. I've never heard that before. That's my. I love that. That's my own logo. <laughs> I love that. So, so how? But how? By by talking to them, by being yes. relatable, by yes, okay. inspiring. So you can't just say, "Don't shoot anybody. Put the gun down. Right. right. Don't sell drugs. What's that going to do? Okay, right. okay. I'm not going to sell drugs. What do I do? I need. I'm hungry. What do I do? Right. You know. So you have to give an option. You have to give. You have to. You have to offer something in exchange for this advice of, you shouldn't pull a trigger. You know, first of all, you don't want to spend the rest of your life in jail. I've mm -hmm. got I've got a little spiel with that one. But I mean, just like the lifestyle. Right. So you have to offer something, you know, like I, I know I know I know this is a fucked up way. I I've been there. I know you can't possibly wake up every morning and think you're living the life. Right. You know, anymore. Right. And um, but how about if we do this, mm -hmm. you know, you have to I give I try to find research. I'm always looking for resources. I always am. That's kind of the point of this podcast. Yeah, I'm constantly <laughs> looking for resources. Yeah, <laughs> constantly, and I, and I find a lot. And I and I mean, people reach out to me from all over, and I won't. I answer every single inbox on social media that I get. Yeah. At the end of every day, sometimes, you know, like like on a Saturday or a Sunday, I'm I'll be checking. But um, I answer. Sometimes I've been on like um, a news channel, mm. and then I'll say that that I answer every message and then I get a bunch of messages and then I'll reply and then the person will come back and say, oh, this was, I was just testing. I heard you say on TV that you answer every message. I didn't believe you. <laughs> now I know you do. And I'm like, oh yeah, I actually really do. That's funny. Yeah, yeah, it's funny. And then, but it, that always happens. And on, or if somebody sees me, you know, or here uh, anywhere on TV or for a five second, if I say that, like if you, publish this I, I i guarantee you when you put this on your um on your pages people are going to inbox me mm. and just and just go like yeah you really do because people don't believe people anymore these days right so um but anyway um a lady and and i answer i mean i get them from california i get them from africa i get them from like all over the world right and uh, so uh, this is the funniest one though and and, and I, I legitimately it doesn't matter if it's in Oregon and it's in a, some a town that I've never heard of. I start, go I just think, okay, well, maybe they just let me tr try to help nudge the path, right? Mm -hmm. And I start Googling whatever they ask me for help with, and I find and I call. I, I do all this stuff, right? And then I'm like, okay, call here, do this, da, blah, blah. But the funniest one is a woman 
I got an inbox message from a woman in Nebraska. And so I thought, so I, you know, I, I, I open it and it's like, hi, my name is so-and-so and I am moving into a senior building and um, I have two cats and they don't, they're not going to let me take my cats and I, I don't know what, what to do with my cats and I don't want them to go to a kill shelter, you know, please, can you help me? Someone said that you would help me. Okay. So I thought, oh my God, like, you know, somebody wrote my name on a bathroom wall for any kind of help at all. Call Bianca right here. Here's her Facebook. Right. So anyway, so I thought she said senior building. Right. So I thought maybe she doesn't, and not everybody knows the internet now, you know, all that stuff. So I thought, okay, let me, so I literally started Googling shelters in, in that town in Nebraska where she was from. I called them, found out, found one that would take the two cats that was a no-kill shelter and found one that would actually go and pick the cats up mm. because I said, I she's moving to a senior building. I don't know how old the woman is. I didn't ask. And then coordinated it, gave her the number. The people called. Then she, her last message to me was, they came and got my cats. Thank you and God bless you. Wow. How crazy, right? That's so random. I know. Very. I get random <laughs> stuff. I really do. I, but I, you know, okay, I'll try to help. I'll do my best. Um, Kind of going a little backwards but like as a first responder paramedic and police um oftentimes when they are dealing with maybe gang violence and a, a shooting um the victims are reluctant to share any information yeah. even if they were the one that was shot they're not um, going to i know yeah. like yeah. what do you what is there anything that a, maybe a paramedic and people are often able to distinguish oh they're not the cops they're, they're there to help you yeah, is there anything you can do you. that can make them more relatable or just like kind of bring them down, bring them to their level of try, just trying to understand where they're coming from? Is there anything more that, that first responders, police, firemen? Well, first of all, even the victim, the shooting victim whose life's just been saved by, yeah. by you is never going to tell you who shot him. Mm. There's nothing that you could say or do that's going to happen because – when it's all said and done, that you're going to return that person back to the same fire that he just got shot in. But you can't, you can't, uh, some, some, like, just do you know what I mean? In like, that twenty minutes, be like, but you don't have to retaliate. You don't have to avenge. You yeah. Know, you don't have so to. yeah, 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 yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> okay, okay. You, you could do that, but okay. I'm saying that, like, as far as like, let's like, say, there's like, more. Shot, you, there's more to life know? than this, you know? Yeah. No, like, no, like, I think that if you if you could, um, so uh, random people that I had didn't know before and then we happen to be there when they got shot and somehow end up getting involved and then know the person or go to the hospital because I, you know, I don't know. I just, you know, like I'm not, I don't want any of your viewers to think I think I'm mother Teresa. I am not mother Teresa, but I literally am so grateful that I am alive and then I have my children and grandchildren and family that I like literally have dedicated my life and every portion of it. I do nothing else all day long then um, work um, for free, you know, I mean, I have a job, but then after that's over, I, yeah. whatever. The only, my only entertainment is Star Trek Voyager at night, and then I go to sleep and I do it all over again, so, and, and Andy Griffith, so, but anyway, but um, the thing is that at that low point, you've just been shot, mm -hmm. you're scared, you almost got killed, they're they're able to contain the built the bleeding in that twenty minute window, right? Um, I think that to kind of have empathy and not like feel sorry like you were a victim, right. not that type of, but empathy to what they're having to deal with um, as a as a young person, right? If somehow to get that in there, the the retaliation after a person's shot, or if your friend is shot, there's usually about a twenty four to forty eight our window before retaliation happens. There's usually the shooting, say somebody gets killed. When somebody gets killed, you'll see on social media the emojis broken heart mm. or mm -hmm. the crying or yeah. rest in peace, I, I'm broken, I can't. I, how can I go on? Within 48 hours, 24 to 48 hours, you start seeing the gun emoji. Now they're mad, right? Mm. So, so I think in your situation, like what, what you're asking, if you can have that um, moment of wind, the the few twenty minutes or something, yeah. to kind of um, 
God had a be- better purpose for you. You mm. know, if you believe in God, you know, or somebody, the the, the universe, right, had a be- had a purpose because you're going to make it. You're going to make it. You know, or something. I mean, you, you just have to. It's hard to say any specific thing to tell you because every every situation is different, right? Yeah. And so, and every person is different. But um, I know that um, if a person just gets shot, they're not going to trust. I mean, of course, they're happy to see the paramedics, mm. you know, obviously in the ambulance, you know. Um, and so they're not, they're not going to look at you really suspect, but they, but they know that whatever you, they tell you that you would tell the police. So they're not going to say anything. And, and I'm not, you're not doing anything wrong, you know, right. but I mean, that's just a known thing. You know, like if I say a lot of kids are like, you know, like, like they shot themselves by accident. They don't even say that, you know, because they don't. You know, like it's crazy, but that that happens mm. because they're trying to be cool and sticking in like Barney Fife stuff, you know, and um, with his one bullet from Andy Griffith, right? So, but anyway, but but it but it's the it is a reality, and so they're never going to tell you anything. So, never ask a question. Just that's the best way not to put them on the defensive. Because if you ask one question, even other than are you allergic to penicillin, mm-hmm. you know, other than medical things. But if you ask one question, you know, like about, do you know what happened? So you were aware, how did this happen? Like, forget it. You're done. He's not going to listen to another thing you say. Damn. Cause oftentimes we just need to know how many, you know, how many shots did you hear? Like we just need to know, I know like, but right. They're not going like... to tell you, <laughs> you might as well forget it. They're not going to tell you you're better off with the community okay. that like, the victim is not going to say, well, I heard three shots and then I felt pain. Okay. They're just going to be like, I don't know. I just heard gunshots and I felt pain. Yeah. Isn't that what they tell you? Right. right yeah. Right, yeah. They're not going to say I heard four shots and they came from the Northwest and, or no, they came from the building. It, it, gonna... it all happened so fast. So yeah. a lot of them forget. Well, anyway, but even if they know. knew, yeah, even if even they if knew, they, knew yeah. they came out of the blue car, they're going to be like, I don't know. I don't know where it came from. I, I, I started hearing shooting and all of a sudden I felt pain and I, oh my God, I'm bleeding. That's, that's the best you're ever going to get. So, so if you wanted to reach a kid at that point and have that window and, um, don't ask any question like that. I know that you guys got to kind of maybe leave that to the police if you're trying to really reach the person. And um, and also another thing is, um, and I, I I was told this and I tell this to people also, mm-hmm. you can do a thousand good things for, for, for one of these young people. A thousand great things, right? And help them a thousand times. And you do one time, you let them down, you lost all your credibility with them, right? So if you want to build credibility and you truly care, and a gun, a shooting victim, a, a victim was shot and survived, and now is in the hospital, right? And the next day on your way to work, stop by and see that person and say, you know, I was the paramedic. I'm just glad, glad you're going to be okay, brother. If you need something, give me a call. Yeah. You'll, yeah. you'll start right there. Okay. Right there, you'll start. Okay. Right there, they'll be like, Man, dude was cool, you know? Someone cares. Somebody cares about me. Right, somebody cares. You know, like, man, look, I was the paramedic. Um, I, don't, I don't know if you remember me or not, but I'm the one that was in the ambulance, and uh, I'm glad you're going to make it. I just wanted to stop by and make sure you're okay. You're, you, you, you know, do you need anything, you right. know? Like, maybe, I don't know, like, depending on their medical situation, they might say, yeah, pop, you know? Yeah, I gotcha. But, but the most thing is to say, you know, here's my card, you mm. know, here's my card. When you get on your feet, let me know if you need, if you need some help, with some resources or something, I'll do my best to help you. Don't promise anything. Cause if you promise something, you don't fulfill their promise. You're dead. Mm. That's not de- literally dead, but you're, you're done. You're done. You have no credibility. I gotcha. So these are all things that build credibility. You never pro- you can't promise somebody a job. You can say, I'll help you look for one. Mm. I'll help you, you know, with this or that. I'll do my best to find a resource. But if you promise them, oh, definitely don't. If you do this and do this, I'll help you get a job. You'll definitely have a job. You, you can't, you might not be able to make good on their yeah. promise, right? You're right. Yeah. So it has to be consistency and, and you have to show the person your heart. They have to see that. And and as hard as it might be sometimes, because you're you may think like not you personally, but many people will think like, well, why should I even care about that person? That person was involved in a shooting, or I don't know what he's done before, and then what caused him to get shot, right? What did, what did he do prior? You know, you you have to erase all that from your head. How do you want to deal with the person doing better or the still out there shooting? Mm-hmm. You know, so mm-hmm. yeah, so that that it's about, and that's how you how an everyday regular person can build credibility. I've been with high risk guys in my car and then I'll see a Chicago police car, you know, 
parked and I'm like, oh, fuck. Because I hate when they pull me over because I have such a bad record mm. that sometimes that leads to um, my car getting searched, which I'm totally legal, you know. But I am I get a little traumatized from my past life. Yeah, so I'm yeah, like yeah, war yeah. shock or something. Right, right. So I'm always like, oh, you know. And, and I don't even speed or anything. But um, and, and the high risk guys have said to me, oh, no, dude, he's real cool. Or it's like, what's he doing over here? Like, one time I was downtown with some guys. And they, and they saw a cop that they knew. I think it was like working at a festival or something. And um, and, and I was like, here, let's walk across the street. And I have nothing against the police, but. You just want to avoid any conflict. Yeah, you know what I mean? Like yeah. I, I, if I see a cop, I walk up to them and I think, I don't care if I'm in Europe. I don't care if I'm in Canada, Mexico. I don't care where around the world I've been. I will walk up and say, excuse me, officer, thank you for your service, for risking your life to keep people like me safe, right? And um, I have a method to that because I think if that if that person, there's a whole, we can't judge the many by the few, right? So if I feel like if I say that to every cop I see, if there was one cop that was going to do something fucked up that day, maybe that me being nice and believing in him may be that moment where I'm like, well, okay, maybe, I'm not going to plant the gun on this person. That, that I don't know. I'm crazy like that, right? So, um, but I do do often do stuff like that. Okay. So, but um, there are even when I was out there in the streets, there's some cops that are like, you know, they're cool. But we're never going to tell them who, who did the shooting. We're never going to say who shot mm. me. We're never going to say what color the car was, you know. Because they still have a job to do. What? The, the cops. N well, yeah. I mean, even if they're cool, they're, I know. you might. They still have a job to do. Yeah. You're, not, yeah. you're never going to say that, you know, because then is the cop going to. I mean, it just ne it's never going to happen. And, it, and it's sad that there's a disconnect. But. Um, it's well, the street we justice. Nip it in the butt before it even erupts in that point. Yeah, that's right? the we, thing. We gotta, that's we gotta the show thing. these kids hope and that there's more to life Beforehand. than violence. Yeah. And it, it shouldn't be where we have to rely on the police to make arrests. I mean, proactive instead of reactive. Yeah, right? absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. If um, just to wrap up, if there's one message you'd like to put out to the world, it can be to the kids that you're mentoring, or maybe you know people that are currently homeless or in in addiction. Um, or maybe just bystanders that are maybe looking for a way to connect with these people, the disparate. Like, what, what would your message be? What, what would Bianca's message be? So my message for people that are just bystanders and just regular people, yeah. um, I would say if you if you want, because I, I believe that the people in general really want to help. Mm -hmm. They just don't know how. And, and then with all the stuff we hear about, donating to this place or that place and what really happened with the money and all this stuff like that. Right. Yeah. So I, I recommend to people like that. If you, if you really maybe donate an hour of your time, you know, mm. in your own community, it could be, you know, I mean, cause like you could live in Wilmette, but there's still people struggling in Wilmette. Right. Yeah. You could live in, um, in Highland park. Most people are one paycheck away from being homeless. Right. Exactly. Right. So there, there's still, there's still things that you can do. Even a regular person, like um, a bystander seeing all this stuff on the news doesn't have to say, well, I have to go to Woodlawn to volunteer. Every community has families or somebody that's struggling, right? So volunteer an hour a week. Yeah. I don't know if you want, you know, to the high risk guys on the streets who are involved. Right. And if they're watching this and follow you, you know who you are. You know who you are, you know. <laughs> so. But I, my, my, um, I feel like they're all my kids, you know, but uh, I'm going to say to them that, you know what, um, who, who are you mad enough at to risk 70 years at 100% in the penitentiary? Who mm. are you mad enough at? And your answer should be no one, right? It's not worth it. I had to look at the camera yeah. for that. Yeah, yeah, Who yeah. are you mad enough at? What are you're mad? You're willing to risk seventy years at one hundred percent in the penitentiary because somebody punked you out on Facebook, right? right. I mean, that's crazy, right? To um, young young people feeling hopeless, and to older or anyone being homeless, being homeless, and and maybe you're not ready to go into a program or you're okay with it. I I, I say really, you know what? There is help out there. And I know addiction is very strong. And I know that everyone could have a better life. I know that the moment that I decided to stop getting high is the moment that all my dreams came true. They didn't happen that minute, 
But now looking back, Mm -hmm. looking back, my dreams all came true. Mm -hmm. And I don't mean that I'm I'm rich with a mansion. I mean, I reunited with my family. I have a good life. I have grandchildren that call me grandma. You know, they Mm -hmm. call call me gangster grandma. (laughs) They're crazy. I know. They're always Googling me. And then I'm like, oh, God, never read this book, right? (laughs) And then they tell me, Grandma, I was in school, and I saw this little girl. Uh, No, like my the 12-year-old granddaughter, she's like another little girl in the school. She was reading your book, and I go, oh, God. And then I go, did you say that was your grandma on the cover? And she goes, no. And I go, okay, never, ever read. So one day they will. But anyway, but when I look back now, I know that single decision for me to at least try, right? I tried, yeah. led to one thing, to the next, to the next. So that's why I like to say saving one kid one day at a time. I always say that. Saving mm-hmm. one kid one day at a time. And I, and I feel like there's so much hatred in the world. And I feel like um, we have to be kinder. Yeah, We can't, and we have to change things ourselves. Stop sitting behind a computer on some farm and God knows where that you've never left, you know, I mean, I mean, I'm just saying there's a lot of disrespect from regular citizens on social media. It's horrible. And it, it's easy to come out when you're hiding behind. A yeah. It's so computer. easy and it's horrible. And I, and I'm just like, Oh my God. And so I don't, I don't judge anybody. I don't care who you sleep with. I don't care who you pray to. I don't care who you vote for. I don't care what you do for a living. I don't care if you're a waitress or a CEO. I will do anything in my power to help you if you need help. Mm-hmm. It doesn't matter. I don't judge anyone yeah. at all. Who am I to judge, right? And um, and even um, people, I have empathy for everyone, even people that don't deserve my empathy, mm-hmm. that don't want my empathy, right? Mm-hmm. I still have empathy for them. And when I say don't deserve it, I mean they're really reckless out there, have, have no ca- kind of morals or compassion for anybody. But I won't give up, right? So to 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 young people, I believe in them. I believe in I believe in young people. I believe they can go to the next level, and do great things in life. They're all so much talent is being wasted in these communities on corners with guns and drugs, and um, and then to little small younger kids being afraid. I I, I say to people, call the YMCA and volunteer for the YMCA. I do for um, a, pro- a project specifically for Story Squad. You should interview them one time. Mm. The um, youth, they're all teenagers, and they go through like a 12 or 16 week program. It's called Story Squad. Mm-hmm. And um, they um, have all experienced trauma of some thing, whether they've been shot or saw sh- someone shot, or their brother was killed, or their mom, or father's in jail, some trauma, right? And most of them are from like South Chicago, South Shore, Inglewood, um, Pilsen, Little Village, all these areas, right? And they, it's art therapy, and mm. they learn how to do spoken word. Mm. I keep hitting your thing, sorry. Um, they, because I'm Italian and I talk with my hands, I, I wouldn't be able to talk at all. But anyway, so um, the thing is that they learned that we just had a graduation last week. I went to it. Vic Mensa, the um, recording oh. artist, came. And he was awarded the uh, 2019 YMC Youth Impact Award. Um, uh, last year it was Kevin Gates and Jacka Gates. Mm-hmm. And I'm like the honorary celebrity getter of, for the YMCA every year. <laughs> but anyway, so, but the kids, the stories will make you want to cry mm-hmm. at their graduation. And you do get teared up. Be- at, but during that 12, 12 week period, the YMCA has like great recording studios and stuff like that for the youth that are in the program. And so they, they work with um, laying out their story. It's, and it's whether they want to sing it, um, a poem, a uh, spoken word, and they put it to music or put it to different, not any pictures of them, but like, you know, different backgrounds, yeah. like video. And then they show certain ones at the graduation. Okay. And, and then the kids will tell their story. Okay. Not all of them are comfortable with it, but the majority become comfortable after. So it's kind of like the therapy of healing, right? Yeah. So like, like I was almost raped at four years old, right? So maybe had I had healing, right? Like I didn't, right? So that's why I can really relate, and that's why it's very close to me. So I think um, y'all, your viewers, should look, take a look, Google YMCA Story Squad, and uh, they usually um, they do take donations for that. Um, 
and uh, the Y gets a lot of funding and, and grants for the program. Yeah. And um, and and they they go through the program and they and they get a, they graduate and yeah huh. it's great. Do you ever feel burnt out or exhausted? No. <laughs> Where does that come from? I don't know. People always say that to me. Yeah. I don't know. I guess the back to the thirty six years self induced drug coma. I've been sleeping. So you're just grateful for another chance. No, I'm just grateful. I I do. I const. I mean, really. I mean, my, when my sister. Um, comes to visit from Florida she I'm like okay we're, we're moving we're on the move let's go you know I spend time with her but she's got to come with me you know I'm like we got to stop here we got to do this she's like oh god she gets a kick out of it though and she likes it but yeah I'm always like okay now we got to go do this interview and we got to go talk to these kids I got to go stop and bring this you know so it's great like tomorrow I got to stop in Pilsen I made a promise to bring um, a book to a girl from the story squad whose mm. brother was killed basically outside of her house at their house and um she was very traumatized and she's a really wonderful you know 16 year old and so i bonded with her just meeting her last wednesday night and i promised her that i will come so now tomorrow morning i'm going by her house in pilsen mm. She's really excited and wants to read the book, and she knows she could do better. And so I feel like the YMCA showed her that, right? Mm -hmm. They showed her some artistic outlet, mm. you know, of things she could do. So and all those kids. So, yeah, it's I don't I don't I know I sometimes feel overwhelmed. Um, I think the last year the overwhelming part has been because of the stress of my lawsuit against mm. cure violence of me being sexually assaulted by their deputy director and then them doing nothing. And then um, me having, I'm not gonna give up, I'm not gonna walk away, I didn't do anything wrong, I'm telling the truth. Um, so I'm willing to take hits and other women have come forward and I won't back down. I'm very strong-minded, um, strong woman and I'm not gonna back down, but I've dealt with a lot of retaliation and I can honestly tell you this past year from the retaliation from them not being wanting to be accountable or or even acknowledging that has been harder than the whole nine years wow. of me even watching kids get killed on the street okay. you know yeah. so it's been like very stressful but what helps me with that because it's so frustrating and like kind of a slap in the face after wait nine years of above and beyond dedication this is and, you yeah. throw me under the bus you yeah, know yeah, i was yeah. a star employee right before this right well, anyway, that's a whole other episode. But um, but um, but how I deal with it, I still volunteer. I volunteer for um, another um, anti-violence group, which is consists of many of the people that once or that worked for Cure Violence Ceasefire. I've known them and been working with them for years. And uh, but then um, with all this transition and there's no more Cure Violence Ceasefire yeah. anymore. So um, as of June 30th, 2019. And last year, with all this dysfunction and all these great people that kept this program alive and made it what it is, um, got their own organization called Aclavis Inc. Mm. Follow them on Facebook, mm -hmm. um, Aclavis um, Inc. Um, on Facebook, like like them, and I volunteer for them, okay. and I do a lot of their um, social media stuff, and I go in and I whatever I I get tickets for them, I help. Whatever I talk to them every day, so I volunteer for um, Build Chicago. Mm. That's another organization that helps youth. I go into the schools with Build Chicago. I um, volunteer at Safe Haven. I volunteer at Good News Partners, Family Matters. Mm. So my life is I'm um, very busy, yeah. but that's how I want it. You okay. know, yeah. Okay. So um, yeah, I'm I'm happy being like that. Oh, wow. As long as I make it home by ten, so I can watch Voyager. Yeah. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Um, that's all I had, Bianca. Thank you so much. Thank you for coming on, sharing yeah, your no time. Yeah, no problem. You've lived thank like you for... seven lifetimes. Oh my God! Yeah, you're not the first interviewer thank, to say thank that. Thank you to for me. for caring for those that don't feel cared for. I want to be the voice of the voiceless. Right. Yeah. Right. Thank you so much. Um. So for everyone that you and know, thank you this... for being a first responder. Oh yeah. And yeah. a paramedic. My pleasure. <laughs> yeah. No, you, you're saving lives. Well, maybe what if these kids find out that they can become a first responder yeah you know that, it's we like, need to tell them that exactly. yeah yeah we, we need to show by you have to you have to sh do it by example yeah yeah 
That's why I told you, stop in right? and see them the next day yeah. after they've survived and let them know that you're so grateful that you said a prayer for them to, to survive. Because right. I know I pray for, for the kids that, and young people that, that I every, I don't watch the news, but I do data here at U, University of Illinois. And so I know how many shooting victims there were today or to, they will tonight. So every night, it, that's in my prayer. Yeah. So if, you, if you've connected where you've say, literally saved someone's life, stopped the bleeding, whatever you did, right? Drug over, even a drug overdose you, you, with the Narcon, right? Narcan, yeah. Yeah. So, like, stop in. I mean, well, usually with that, they get let out right away. But but a shooting victim, definitely, yeah. definitely, make that connection, and and I guarantee it'll go far. Okay. And and a lot of a lot of times with with the, the first shooting that a person has, yeah. so many people sometimes there's a whole lot of people that get shot more than one time. They get they get what the doctor saves their lives. They get out, they get shot again, come right back, right? I'm sure you've seen this. Mm -hmm. All right. And I've heard surgeons have told me this, you know, like, wow, this kid, a year of therapy and, and tra trauma treatment, right? And then four months later, he came back. Now this time he died, you know? So so with that being said, um, the, if it's the first shooting, the first time somebody gets shot, they probably don't have a real bad record at that point, mm -hmm. right? So there, there could be a turning point, mm -hmm. right? And so that's a good thing for you to build that rapport and, and, and follow up because if you don't follow up, you lost your credibility. The little bit of credibility mm -hmm. that, you, that you made, if you don't follow up, if you say, um, do you mind if I come check on you? They'll probably go, no, it's cool. As long as you don't ask them no police questions. <laughs> You'll be okay then. Okay. Yeah. Um, where can people find you? Um, I'm on you, I'm on social media. Yeah. My on my name Angelia Bianca. Angelia I'm on Instagram Bianca. Angelia okay. Bianca. I'm okay. on Twitter Angelia Bianca. Yeah. Most of my um, I'm I'm not a big Twitter person for sure. I'm more on Instagram mm. and Facebook. I'm yeah, and you answer all your DMs. Yeah, and I'm heavily followed. You know, <laughs> and and it's like, and that's okay. And all my I, I'm always trying to uplift the community right, or a right. person or. Show somebody a better way. Yeah. I make my own. How do you say them? memes? Memes, yeah. Memes, yeah. So whatever, whatever you guys invented, <laughs> I, I do that now. So I make my own with some little message, and I just want to empower people. But they can find me here. Um, they can send me an inbox, and I would give them my phone number. The whole world knows my phone number. If for any reason my phone, something happened to that phone number, I don't care what the phone, but the phone number. Oh my God, I would just. I can't even imagine my life if I couldn't. Without have knowing number. these people, you would just jump at it. You know, you I, would just I, somebody will drop say to me, and, "I do. Yeah. I, I actually do." I sat on my bed one night. Somebody, somebody reached out to me from California, which was some rival gang stuff, Crips and Bloods, and um, in Sacramento, California, and I don't. Know, this it's too long of a story, so I won't go sure. into it. But I sat on my bed in Rogers Park in the middle of the night in Chicago on social media, inboxing back and forth. The, the guy, one guy was gonna take his own life because he couldn't take it anymore, the whole situation that was going on. I went on his Facebook page, found whoever likes the most of his posts, then inboxed them and said, okay, baby girl, dig this. I'm not the police, I, I'm really cool. I'm an anti-violence person. My name is Bianca, I'm from Chicago. I'm not, I just need you to call, please call me right now, I'll explain right now. I gave my number, she called, I explained got to the right people, mediated the conflict, all without ever meeting them. That's insane. And then, then helped the kid get into a, um, never met him, helped him, I'm still in touch social media yeah. wise, but helped him get in an alternative school, high school. He graduated, had his girlfriend film while he was getting his diploma and gave a shout out to Bianca that this wouldn't have happened. Isn't that great? I started that crying. Great. Oh, oh my God. God. Huh. Yeah. So yeah. And I answer everybody. So if anybody needed to get a hold of me for any volunteer um, opportunities or just for help or help with your kids, um, just reach out to me on social media, and um, I will definitely answer you. Cool. And I'll give you my phone number too. Uh -huh. You know, <laughs> if you say something crazy and creepy, then I'll block you. You know, but otherwise, I give I give a lot of chances. You yeah. Know? yeah. Okay. So. Well, yeah, guys, thank you so much for staying tuned. Um, stay curious. Aloha. I'll see you in the next episode.